Welcome everybody to the committee of the, the, the whole. Um, the, uh, I'll just go over a few uh, ground rules uh, uh, here is, is that uh, um, you can speak on any topic, uh, just make it uh, relevant to that topic, um, and just ask that you abide by the same rules that we have on the blue cards for uh, the yellow card's not up there, Ms. Mayo? Yes, okay, met, met Mr. Um, Greer, get him up there shortly. And uh, anyway, on you know when you sign the blue cards on Thursday night, you agree to, to no name calling and and uh, several other um, 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 polite um, um, things. So I just ask that uh, we stick to that that tonight. Um, if I if I do make a ruling um, from the chair that somebody um, in the committee disagrees with, um, I just ask that you make a, a, a call for a point of order. Um, and uh, um, make a ma motion to overrule the chair um, or ask for a suspension of the rules um, for that one particular um, topic or even at a later date we could meet to change the rules if, if we just think that they're un un unreasonable. That moves us into the Boyd Forum section and I promised uh, um, former Councilwoman DeWeese the opportunity to explain what the rules of the Boyd Forum um, are. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I did go back and look at the video of the introduction of this and from Mrs. Boyd speaking um, and what our hopes for the Boyd Forum would accomplish. And we do actually have a section on our website that talks about Boyd Forum responses uh, to help the citizens see the success of bringing their issues forward and having them addressed by council as a whole and also the mayor. And um, it is for one m minute. Um, and you would read their name and state their, their issue. If it's an issue that's on this agenda, um, w the citizen would need to wait, and that was a determination from the chair um, until that item is being discussed. And if it is an ongoing item being debated, again, it is one minute that they have, um, and that's just I wanted to remind everyone of that. Okay. So, it, in, in other words, it's any issue that they want. It's not just if they've got a pothole on their street that hasn't been addressed. Well, traditionally, it's been um, issues with adjacent buildings or, you know, uh, code enforcement or law enforcement. We've had some issues come forward. Um, so it's generally been of that nature so that a citizen could talk to their council as a whole because it's hard to contact each individually. So, and to have the mayor's staff available as well. So that's what it was designed for, and certainly in the that, spirit of that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Dubasan, you have one minute, ma'am. Welcome. Thank you. I'll try to be succinct. I rise this afternoon um, to bring to your attention the last two meetings of the City Council and the uncomfortable position that some of us were in the audience that were, uh, were put in, at which time citizens were not allowed to raise questions and make comments that they felt very strongly about. I believe that we as a community are a civil community and that we can agree to disagree and that the intellect and the expertise of all citizens should be honored whether or not we agree with them. I also believe that when the mayor's representative is sitting there to give a report to this council, it should have information which is of importance to the community to learn about things and that critical actions should be shared with the council rather than scolding of citizens and council members for raising questions which make the administration uncomfortable. I would like to see our mayor present. I would like for every member of this council to encourage him to show up at each and every public entity event and at each and every city council gathering or meeting that's possible because I believe the citizens of this community need more interaction, not less interaction with our mayor. And I ask each of you council individuals to look at how you have behaved, how you have acted on behalf of the citizens, and to return civility by demanding that every member of your council act according to the Constitution of the United States, the ethics of the state of Florida, and the ethics of this local community. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ms. Dubasan. Uh, Ms. Barbara Mayall. Hi, Barbara Mayall. Um, I just wanted to, um, Andy Andrews just came out with the new book, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with him. Uh, he's from our local area. Um, and he does state 
Knowing that the quality of one's answers can only be determined by the quality of one's questions. And so from that, I want us to ask some good questions. The one quote I just want to finish with, Andy Andrews issues a wake-up call. Become informed, passionate citizens who demand honesty and integrity from our leaders or suffer the consequences of our own ignorant and apathy. Furthermore, we can no longer measure a leader's worth by the yardsticks provided by the left or the right. Instead, we must use an unchanging standard, the pure, unvarnished truth. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayo. Mr. Mike Kilmer. Thanks for having me. It's Mike Kilmer. I'm at uh, 2818 West Jackson Street, um, Pensacola. I have a two and a half year old daughter, um, which you can probably see from the rings under my eyes, and we have another one on the way. Um, she loves to play in the playground, and I told her that I would ask you guys um, why the three playgrounds behind the Alinestra school are locked up all the time, and she won't let me forget it. Um, because for us to walk to a playground, we have to go down to G and Gregory, which is a pretty long walk, and then, you know, the walk back, fun, but we don't always have time for it. So every time we drive by, she goes, we have to ask them why the Red Playground is locked up. So I wanted to bring that to your um, attention and see if there's anything I can do about it. Mr. Chairman, uh, is that part of the school property possibly? And uh, if it's on I mean, their school boundary, they would keep it locked at all times? Well, the school is, it has been shut down. Yeah, but if it's on their school boundary, that's why it's always been locked up. It was part of the school uh, safety plan and fenced in probably. Yeah. Um, and then so now with it being a closed property, it's probably a liability issue uh, with them being owners that it was not a public park. It was part of their school playground. Okay. So, uh, no, I understand yeah, that. So tell um, her it's part of the school. Okay. <laughs> I think the her. bigger <laughs> issue was maybe um, there's a way that we could do some magic to um, – <laughs> make the playgrounds that are under lock and key and not being used and the full green grass city block that's not being used available to the two and a half to 12 year olds or uh, younger that play in the streets in my neighborhood. Um, the other thing, if I could just bring up, if I have time to bring up another um, um, issue is I really appreciate this Boyd Forum. I feel like the um, participation in politics is largely the occupation of the privileged people. Um, how many waitresses, maids, or servants are here in the room today? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think... And Mr. Mr. Kimmer, I would yes. I would love to invite you to come Thursday night and 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 talk about about that issue. We, we're we're past the, the 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 one minute that the Boyden Forum was was designed for. You get four minutes, two different times, um, at the Thursday night meeting. You would, there's the opportunity if there's enough time for four minutes in the first half of the first 30 minutes of the meeting, and then it's pretty much unlimited time after all the other businesses has been con con conducted. But uh, um, Mr. Townsend okay. had a, um, a comment or a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do you have a uh, green or black garbage can? I'm outside of the city. You're outside of 2800 Block Hills outside the city. Uh, but, I, but I think uh, Councilwoman DeWeese is correct uh, regarding uh, that school property uh, over there might be a good idea that you speak to someone on the school board, the person that represents your district over there could possibly help you, and either or your county commissioner who might could help you in, in relation to trying to see how they could secure that property. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to really um, just close by saying that I think all of the council people's hands should have been up when I asked if there were any servants in the room. Well, let me just share something with you. I plan to share this with 
your county com uh, commissioner. And in fact, if you would leave your telephone number, uh, maybe I will have them contact you where they can give you some assistance. Okay. Terrific. Thank you very hey, much. You're, you're welcome. And I, I have your phone number here, Mr. Kilmer, and I can pass that on to him if you want. Yeah, that'd be terrific. I'd okay. love to hear from you. And Dr. Wu. Yeah, uh, Mr. Kilmer, uh, you don't have to respond. Uh, I think uh, Councilwoman DeWeese uh, put her finger on it. But what I would encourage you to do, as Councilman Townsend so aptly said, is I would do one or two things. Talk to the school board member who represents your district and or go to a school board meeting. There's ever po been a possibility that they may open the gates during certain hours, you know, have that type of arrangement. But unless they know you're concerned about it, uh, there's no way for them to react to it. And uh, it's not that we're ignoring your request. We have no power over what the school board does, uh, as they don't have any power pretty much over what we do. But I would encourage you very strongly to talk to school board members. I think you'd uh, find, it'd make it, certainly, certainly. Um, I do think that the fact that there aren't any playgrounds in my neighborhood does fall under the jurisdiction of this council, even though I may be one and a half blocks from the actual city proper. I'm in the city. Most of my money gets spent in the city we as well. <coughs> okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. Mr. Marlin, is it Mueller or Baller? Hi, it's Marlon Mueller. Um, I had a, a, a written. Uh, statement but at time is not going to allow the whole thing so I'll just I'd like to um, without offending anybody I'd like to read off a few words and then give you an explanation of why I'm doing this Nazi Gestapo fascist class warfare cronyism carpetbaggers Jesus haters anti-semitics lazy liars losers idiots crooks incompetent leeches beaners wetbacks Polacks mix Russians Japs niggers and white trash while those 29 words listed as a representation of what a thoughtful and well-adjusted society considers inappropriate, and though it makes my blood boil when I hear them used in a hurtful way, we must always be mindful that all speech when redressing our government is protected, and that any, and I repeat, any restriction on speech goes against the Constitution of the United States and is a sure sign of a fascist, totalitarian government. I've witnessed some on this council be moved by words to the point of loss of self-control. I've witnessed members of this council who are more concerned about what they are feeling or how the spoken word may be viewed than they are about good governing. I've witnessed this council's president strip a United States citizen of their First Amendment rights because he didn't like what the citizen was saying. Because of this, I'm asking President Sam Hall to do the right thing and step down from the chair. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'd also invite you to come back Thursday night as, as, as well and, and get four minutes twice. So thank you. Dr. Melody Castro. In April... 2011, April 9th, a man broke into my home and hid in my daughter's room, and I was arrested for defending my home and children. Joshua Hansen is guilty of breaking and entering, filing the false police report. My daughter was molested, and lewd and lascivious acts were committed in front of her by this man while I was in jail for three days, falsely arrested. I filed charges against him in August at the Sheriff's Department. Nothing has been done. My daughters live in terror and fear, knowing this man roams free five miles away from us. My daughter and I were eating at Sonic last night. Joshua Hansen drove by us, honked his horn, and my daughters were terrified. I looked into my daughter's beautiful face, and no, I can't protect her. And knowing this is absolute agony. I am bringing your attention to the city's rogue law enforcement and the ones who are entrusted with serving and protecting, dropping the ball when it comes to defending its citizens' rights and freedom and actually ensuring that the real criminals are held accountable. On that note also, Councilperson Townsend, you are my personal representative on this council, and I am asking you to bring the chair for president of this council to a vote also. Thank you. 
Thank you. Do you have some response? Yeah, uh, Dr. Castro. Yes. What's, what's the street address? I was trying to determine the, the address here. 3325 Teller Court. Where is that located? It is on the west side of Pensacola. Okay. All right, I, I will get in touch with you and talk more with you if you don't mind. Thank you, okay. sir. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have a last name here. Uh, Catherine. I'm sorry, but I sometimes am a little um, absent-minded in filling out forms. My name is Catherine Dixon. I've spent the last two weeks living mostly in your court, your um, city hall courtyard. I am in transition seeking a new place to resettle. I am the daughter of a Korean War veteran. I'm the granddaughter of a First World War veteran. My grandfather, the veteran, had three, two sisters and a brother and a couple of in-laws who were snowbirds in Pensacola. And my question was, should I consider resettling in or near Pensacola? Is this a place I can contribute to? Is this a place that would be supportive of me? I am concerned with the homeless community here in town, and I'm also concerned with the Occupy community in town. I'm wondering what can I teach them? What can I learn from them? What can I share with them? I um, <coughs> am enjoying my rediscovery of this area. We never traveled here in wintertime. We visited my father's parents in Miami, or near Miami. But as someone who still is at large in Pensacola, Councilperson Megan B. Pratt, as a rep representative on this council, I am asking you to please bring the chair for president of this council to a vote. Thank you. Thank you. And next is Ms. Cheryl Cloyster. Thank you. I have enjoyed living in uh, Pensacola. I find it a very lovely, lovely community. And Councilperson Myers, you are my personal representative on this council. And I am deeply grateful for your care and concern for the constituents that you represent. Thank you. And I am especially appreciative of your, your care in dealing, well, just as we watch today the uh, financial matters being discussed and your intelligence, I, I do enjoy yeah, that. Thank, thank you. Thank you very you. much. However, I am asking you to please bring the chair for president of this council to a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that concludes the uh, Boyd Foreman. I have no other um, slips before me. Um, Sam, yes. I feel about one. Did you? I'm sorry I don't have it, Gary, but uh, we certainly all know who Gary is. Come on up here. You've got your one minute. Gary Sanson, between 17 East Jackson, city of, citizen of the city and the CRA. Uh, I value voids for him. I'm also a member of Movement for Change. And uh, I came here walked in before I walked in the building I thought man I'm gonna miss Miss Carol the, the smiling face Miss Richardson to all of you what Carol now I walk in there's a couple policemen limited to the first and second floor not being able to set up well I can probably set up a talk with anyone most people they can they are home well, it's like they say, they're home fixing supper, getting ready to take care of the homework with their children. But I make it a point to try and keep up. Everybody can't take, can't afford to pay gas increase, can't afford to buy the paper. But I do promise, I'll try and be gentle and softer and polite. I will. But one minute, if you listen to these citizens, well, these people out here, they're probably American citizens, have a right under the Constitution. One minute is dearly not enough. 
Oh, they might have found it. Oh, I'm sorry calling you Sam. It's Mr. President. I will try and be a little more polite next time. And a Happy New Year to all of you. Staff, too. And return phone calls if I call you Mr. President. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. You know, and I apologize. There's Dixie Meese. I had forgotten to call um, her up as, as well. So, we'll, Miss Meese? Is it Meese or Mize? Okay, I'm sorry. I have been in Pensacola for about a little over a year now. I first came about four years. I fell in love with this city. I opted to spend my latter years, and Lord, I hope it's many. I truly believe in the local politics. I believe in starting with the local, because that's who's take care of our community. I truly love this place. However, I have been offended by the way that the council, especially the president, has not allowed the First Amendment to be done. So as I'm very blind. Councilperson Spencer, you are my personal representative on this council. I am asking you to please bring the chair for president of this council to a vote. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Myers. Yes, I would just like to respond to um, everyone who spoke just briefly. I, I had not planned on being here today. I have a tooth problem, and thank goodness I was able to, to, to get here. But uh, I am going to plan on bringing up some issues regarding the First Amendment on Thursday night. And I would encourage all of you to, to come back uh, Thursday night. You all have uh, public forum opportunities uh, where we can go into more depth. The, Bo the Boed Forum was actually designed for people to just have one minute to bring a problem before the, the city council and have their particular council person address the issue. Uh, so I, I do encourage you to come, come back on Thursday night. And I will, uh, I am planning on bringing up uh, some issues regarding the First Amendment uh, Thursday night. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President, and I uh, thank Ms. Myers for also responding to the citizens. Um, I'm a bit concerned about having further discussion on this on Thursday night. This is our business meeting tonight, um, and I realize Boyd Forum is not the appropriate venue for that, um, and if it pleases the chair, if you would give me a time that you'd like to discuss this so the citizens will know, would you rather it be during new business at the end of this current agenda? Um, or when we open up our um, discussion items. I, I would prefer this issue be at new business um, um, towards the end. Okay, but, and I do want to thank you. the citizens for coming out. I think it takes a great deal of courage to come and speak to this issue. Um, several members have asked specifically directly to Councilman Hall for um, him to resign and then also urged their council members and um, actually an individual in our community said, and this is in his own words, that he had learned through his challenges in life and the, the path that he has chosen and the work that he does to never believe the negative any individual is the collective of the whole. And I thank you for seeing that um, this is an individual action and an issue that we as a council may be forced to deal with. Um, but I don't want to be put in that position. I think the citizens have spoken and are deeply concerned about what occurred, and I would ask uh, Mr. President to consider that. All right. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Okay. So I want to remind everybody that these are for Boyd Forum, and if you've got issues that are part of the agenda on the business. There's no need to fill one out. You'll be recognized during that time. And uh, yeah, it's not on there. Okay, this will be the last person during Boyd Forum, Miss Merritt. My name is Sonia Merritt. I live at 805 South J Street. 
and when we were discussing the previous problem, Mr. Townsend, we need to do something about the parking at Sanders Beach. I don't want to park at 11 o'clock at night two blocks away from my home. I cannot, I live on J Street, a half a block from the park. And then when they're both having events at the grotto and then, it really gets out of hand. And the park's being used more and more, and I never know when I won't have a place. And the people are not very nice sometimes when I ask them to move, if they're parking right there. I will get in touch with you and talk more about, are you talking about when they have the events at? Yes, they don't, pr they keep saying they're trying to buy property, they're trying to buy property, but they still need to make some kind of, you know, so we, the citizens of that neighborhood, are not totally inconvenienced. I'll give you a call. Thank you. Councilman okay. Hall. I just, Dr. Pratt. I'm going to let uh, Mr. Townsend mostly handle this, but I, I will make the suggestion that one option might be to have resident only sections where you have to have a sticker that's the way they handle it in cities with more parking issues so as you continue those discussions keep that as an option thank you, thank you. All right. mr reynolds under mayor communications and actions thank you mr president the first item on the uh, council agenda agenda today is special magistrate recommendation request for lien reduction at 417 east government street the recommendation is the City Council approve a recommendation from the Special Magistrate to reduce the recorded lien against the property located at 417 East Government Street and authorize the Mayor to execute the appropriate documents. Move the approval. Second. Second. Motion and a second. Ms. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I did have a few questions on this, and it's a matter of, I guess, documentation or um, notification I uh, looked this information up on this property and there was a um, quick claim deed uh, in 2010 um, and I'm wondering from the city's perspective would the uh, property owner have been aware of the uh, liens that were in place at that point if I may uh, council president I'd like to ask uh, mr. Bill weeks to come forward and address that issue mr. weeks did you hear mr. weeks's question Yes, I did, uh, Council. Uh, Ms. Minshew is much more up to date on this one than I am, and she can probably explain the, uh, the uh, quick claim deed uh, better than I can because I wasn't aware of it. Ms. Minshew, if you don't mind. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lisa Minshew. I'm an attorney. I represent Ms. Denman, and she's the owner of 417 East Government. I have some things I'd like to say on the uh, recommendation when it's the appropriate time, but to just answer the specific question, uh, this property was in the Berrios family for many, many years, um, well-known uh, family, Berrios and Acosta Roofing Specialty Metals, a very respected family. Over time, it has uh, descended through the heirs uh, to Miss Denman, who is of that family. Uh, recently, her brother, Joe Denman, who's here, um, took title with her uh, to try to raise some money to repair the building. And then, subsequent to that, Mr. Denman got married, and he decided he didn't want to be on the property anymore, so the quit claim was recorded to take him off. So there really hasn't been a transfer out of the property. It's just been transferred down through the heirs. Is it being sold at this point? Is that what it, I understood the briefing that's to be? The, that's what's being attempted. And it shows that it's assessed for $225,000. Is that, I mean, is there, I, I, it, the, the value of this was what, 35? What was the amount that we're charging? The lien? The amount of the lien. It's $25 a day. But and were the owners aware of the, the, the fine being levied at $25 a day? That's Miss Denman, who is still the owner, and she was aware. Um, that's why I said I have a few comments to make about all of that when you okay. think it's the most appropriate time. That's all the questions I had. Anybody else? Okay, got a motion, second. She wanted to make well, some comments, I, I, though. May I please... The chair, yeah, I, I think it's appropriate to allow Ms. Benshew to make some comments on behalf of her client now. Yeah, I appreciate the motion, and I, I understand all of us are under a 725 deadline, so I will try to be quick about it. Um, 
first thing I wanted you to think about, um, I know you have a lot on your plate, but we've seen through this issue that there's a, a real problem in the city where we need to have an, a, a procedure or an ability for property owners to close out these kind of liens when they're trying to sell their properties. Um, we need to have some type of an administrative procedure that allows staff to be able to handle these liens so that we can do closings and sell properties. Uh, we're all trying to build up the downtown and, and to get the economy going and uh, the amount of hearings we've been to and the procedures we've been trying to go to get this resolved is, is kind of mind boggling. Um, and, and if you really want to be able to uh, keep your contributing structures in the city and downtown and have them improved, uh, those of us out there trying to work these deals, we need your help on this because this is clearly not the way to get things moving. Uh, what, what we've done is we have a contributing home that was built in 1928. It's a half a block from Seville Square. Many of you probably have seen it and wondered what is going on with it. Um, Miss Denman, as I said, is the heir to the house. She doesn't live there, but she's been trying to keep it up and, and trying to do what she can to allow it to continue because of the family history there. But she is in ill health. Um, she has filed bankruptcy, and she has no ability whatsoever to, um, to bring this house back up to where it could be, uh, as it probably was in 1928 when it was built for the Berrios family. Um, as a result, there were, uh, you know, a sequence of events. You had the hurricane. You had different things happen. Things happened to the house of which she was unable to, to do work. Then there was uh, an order it entered where there was to be a, a small amount of work done, really. Uh, uh, steps fixed, the uh, blue tarp taken off the roof, some roof repair, some broken window glass repaired, and the wood to be covered by a protective treatment. Uh, it was Ms. Denman's understanding that she had satisfied those requirements and met with a code enforcement officer and was told, just keep the, the grass cut, kind of in a mothball type setting is the best way I can explain <coughs> it to you. That when you have these contributing structures, you don't really want to tear them down, but you don't have the money to fix them, what do you do? You do your best to protect them, to keep it up so it's not a hazard or a nuisance, and then you have to wait until somebody with money comes. And that's what she was, has been doing. She finally had somebody come, somebody who also owns property in the historic district, who wanted to buy it, wanted to restore it, and open a business. That buyer has been working with us, working with the city staff, to try to do that. Unfortunately, because of the red tape, because of the problem of going through hearings, not being able to get on hearing schedules uh, quickly, the, today their deal expired. So we've lost the buyer. Uh, the people that had the money to restore. They also went before the architectural board to request to demolish the building. The architectural board said, well, we need to think about it. We'll put you off 60, 90 days. Well, buyers in this market do not sit around and wait for 60 to 90 days. So they're gone. Now we have to find a new buyer. In the meantime, the building is not going to be restored because the owner has no money. Um, and so it's going to continue to decline. I tell you this not only as her attorney, but I own property just three buildings down. And we all need this property to be something to happen to it so all of our businesses can prosper and the values can start to go up again. So it's a frustrating situation, and I, and I hope council will direct staff to, to come up with some way that we can administratively deal with these liens in the future so that when you have a buyer coming in ready to buy as is, you can do that. Currently, the procedure is if there's a lien in place, even if you pay it at closing, the lien stays and does not go away until the house is completely put up to code. So a new buyer who comes in as a prospective investor says, why the heck would I do that? I'm going to come in immediately, day one, $25 a day, while I'm trying to figure out what I need to do with this building. So it, it's a real problem, and, and I, I request that you would try to come up with some way to work Ms. with Mitch, that. Ms. Mitch, just, just one moment. I had a question for sure. the, the, the city attorney. 
it's it's tough for me to to keep up with with all this and the differences between one case and another and why we vote um, uh, affirmatively in 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 some instances and and not in the in in the other. It seems like to me that when we had a financial institution that had ended up with, let's say, a house like, is it, Joe, is it your mother's house? That's my grandparents' house. Your, your grandparents' house, um, 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 like we've got here, but it ended up in the hands of a financial institution, and the financial institution says, we've got a buyer, and didn't we, uh, haven't we done approval of lien relief contingent up on that property? being transferred over to a new owner? Yeah, I don't remember that particular instance, but I, I, I'm sure we have. And uh, I, I believe in this case, uh, this was one of the first cases that went through our special magistrate. Right. So I think you can rely on his expertise sure. and recommendation. And his recommendation is that essentially it's better to take a percentage of something than a percentage of sure. nothing. So he's recommended approval of this. Um, and, and and I think it, it begs the larger question, and uh, my office will take a look at it, uh, has been taking a look at it, and I'd also defer to the mayor's office. Our procedure is essentially the same as the county, but, but realistically, uh, n no one who amasses these 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollar fines has a wherewithal to pay it. Mm. So we're going to have to come to grips with that at some point and either foreclose on the properties or cap the liens or forgive them. And, and I think this is one way to do it. In other words, uh, Ms. Minchin and her client, has, has, they've been through the hearing process. The special master we pay to figure these things out has recommended a reduction. And I think absent any other extraordinary circumstances, uh, will probably be advisable to follow his recommendation. Okay. All right. If I could just finish when you, yes. I'm sorry to take too much time. Since we met with the special master, that was December 7th. Um, you know, it's been some time. We tried to get up in front of you and we met, we missed the deadline because the special master's order didn't come out quick enough. So we couldn't get on your agenda in December. Um, in the meantime, we met with architectural board. They put off any kind of approval for 90 days. And so, and like I said, our deal is gone. We don't have a buyer anymore with the money to pay you. So, as I told you, Ms. Denman has, has tried to do her best with this property. And she thought she had done what she should. And this fine has, has grown over time as a result of that. She hired a contractor who apparently didn't go get a permit. She didn't know that. Um, there's some wood that needs protectant. You look around downtown, you see a lot of houses that haven't been painted. But apparently this one needs to be painted. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to get past this. So what we're going to request, uh, Mr. Ray came up with a great proposal, but the timing of it just doesn't work for us now because of the buyer leaving. So what I'd like to propose you to consider as an alternative motion, if you would, is to actually give Ms. Denman until April 1st of this year to actually complete those corrections. What our plan is to try to find um, some volunteers to come in, scrape it, and paint it, if we can get somebody to donate some paint, and to pull a permit to, to, to take care of code enforcement's issues on the steps and try to get that done. It's very difficult and basically impossible to do by February 1st. If we had a buyer, that'd be great. You know, buyer takes care of everything, but the buyer's gone. So we'd request you to let her have till April 1st to actually do the correction herself. And then if, if she finds a buyer, um, then that's different. We're, we're gonna put it up for a uh, listing and to have somebody permits by June 1st um, to, to do whatever they're going to do, demolish and or repair. And then to give Ms. Denman until the end of the year to either find a buyer or pay it herself or find a donor um, to pay the 10000 That's what we'd request because right now it just can't happen. And we want to save the building. We want to restore the building. 
but you got to be able to work with people. And I need it there to be some finality so we can give it to a realtor and a realtor can say to any potential investor, we know exactly what we're going to, you're going to have if you buy it. You've got this much time to either demolish or pull a permit to restore it. You've got this much time to pay the fine. And, and if you don't, then these are the alternatives. So that's what I'm requesting is that as an alternative that you give Ms. Denman until April 1st to, to finalize the original corrections, to June 1st pull permits to either demolish and or bring it up to code, and then to the end of the year to pay the 10000 At that point, I believe Mr. Ray had suggested everything just goes back to the way it is, which is the fine continues to grow and I mean, ultimately, the building is just going to fall down. Mr. Townsend and then Ms. DeWeese. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> How did we uh, arrive at the 10000 Well, we had a, uh, about a two-hour hearing in front of Mr. Ray, and we presented all the evidence of how we got here. Um, we talked about the fact that Ms. Denman had hired a contractor, and we put all that evidence to him. And uh, we also talked about the cost to demolish was going to be about $10,000. And I believe Mr. Ray, in his wisdom, he didn't make the decision in front of us, um, came to that as a reasonable number. I, I think there's, a, there's in your code, if the building is not repairable, the maximum fine is 5000 So it, it, I guess some of that equity was being considered also that, you know, it seems like that should be the maximum you'd be fining anyway. Was any request made to uh, forgive the whole thing and just pay the $535? We did not request that, but we sure would love you if you did that. <laughs> I'm mad <and> so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Understand, nobody's making any money here. This is uh, just a... a trying to get move it forward well it's not far-fetched that we have done that uh, okay. eradicated the whole thing and I, I'm just wondering why this one of the first decisions that have come out of this system bill yes uh, mr. Townsend it is I understand this this case has been going on for over four years it didn't just get like this I'm well aware of this and, house and I know the house I, I know the background of the house uh, probably more so than the attorney over there <laughs> <laughs> I think Mr. Ray was, uh, there's a concern, at least a consideration that council doesn't like to reduce fines or liens. And, and my understanding was Mr. Ray was trying to make it in a number that might be appealing to you mm -hmm. instead of just wiping it away. But we didn't request any particular number. Okay. And let me ask you another question if I understood you correctly. You indicated that um, you had a barrier. And um, but the lien uh, or the fine continued, right? And I think that's going back to the other question that was raised. Once there's a determination that the property is being sold, do we not stop the continuation of the fine uh, and get and and not ensure that the newcomer is going to be have a, a constantly being fined too? Well, in, in this case, Mr. Townsend, there, there's a lien on the property. If it were just a fine running, what we would have to do is stop that, cap that, and then uh, notify the new owners of, of the violations and then start the process over again. Like I said, in this case here, it, it's already gone past the fine but you status. But you do cap the continuation of the fine. It does, it does cap it at that point, but there's a lien all right, on this that. one. Not a fine. It's, this is a lien, all right? Mm -hmm. So if it were a fine, we could cap it and then turn around and notify the new owners and they'd be in front of Code Enforcement Board. We would do the same thing with this one once it transferred. But I don't think it could transfer with the lien, with a lien out there for $35,000 on it. I think we got a disconnect here. What I'm asking you, you've got a, a buyer. There is a lien. Okay. When you have a lien, you do not have any continuation of a fine on a day-to-day -day basis. No, not, not when it changes hands. It would start with a new owner. The, the case would start over again with a new owner. Oh, okay. Now, that's okay. not what we were told. I just want to make sure you understand that up until this moment, we were told that that lien would continue, the $25 would continue to accrue 
regardless of any payments, even if the property changed ownership, and that the new buyer was aware of that and walked away. So if there's a change, I appreciate it. But I was told administratively that was impossible until the building was brought fully to code. And so I, have an actual, a, I have an email to that effect. So in actuality, that would run the buyer your way. Uh, exactly. if, if in fact, you know, he's going to be continually fined. And uh, under the gun. Uh, it should stop and give the new owner an opportunity to clear up the property. Well, I think in, in Mr. Ray's uh, determination here, that was taken into account by giving dates that the things would be done uh, in, in this situation here. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Weiss and then Mr. Spencer. And Councilman Townsend asked a great deal of the questions, and my concern would be that is if there's not a buyer for us to take action on this and the dates are being adjusted, that the special magistrate actually determined those dates to be acceptable because it's a quite complicated plan that he came up with. But I would like to know for certain, in fact, um, about the new owner, if they'll be given the opportunity in the 30-day grace period or applying for permits to remedy the situation. Um, and, in fact, they may not be gone if that's the case. I don't know what, what would happen, but um, if there's an email to that effect, if we could get something documented from the special magistrate or from our um, city staff to address that issue, that would be helpful as well. I appreciate that. I, I, you know, the more time that goes by, the harder this becomes. And every time it gets postponed and we're still left in this limbo of not knowing how to deal with it, we can't even really market the property. Um, and so we, I would request that you uh, consider, especially now that the magistrate situation is new and, and they are just recommending to you, that, it, that since we're here and we've waited to, to get to you, that you would go ahead and approve our request so that we can have some certainty. I mean, the worst case scenario is at the end of the year, we're right back where we were. Okay, Mr. Mr. Townsend's wanting to make a substitute. Okay, motion. that's fine. I was I, I'd like to make a substitute motion that we um, approve uh, the eradication of, of the total amount of the uh, of the lien, including the $10,000. Uh, they pay the uh, 535 and give them a certain date to uh, get the property up to speed. Second. Okay, well now I have, I have a question regarding that. I know I've, I've still got to get to you, Mr. Spencer, but re regarding that, that issue, if we do that, and then at that date certain, then what happens if, if, if those conditions aren't met? If those conditions aren't we revert back to okay. the, the original. Okay, that's all Mr. Spencer. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to share with um, fellow committee members and, and the audience, you know, the, that this special magistrate um, process, I think, is a huge improvement. I know... It, I, listening to you in this sort of isolated case, this version cast perhaps a little bit of a negative light on what I think is a huge improvement in the application of code enforcement in our city. So please keep in mind that while we are currently tonight discussing the homeowner, um, the descendants of those of the original home, we always have to remember that code enforcement is primarily in place for those affected property owners that are adjacent and, and across the street and in the neighborhood. I mean, that's, that's what this process is, is about. Um, so it's very difficult when we are asked to make um, basically significant deviations that are based on someone's perhaps ability to emotionally appeal to us, whereas some people just may not have the, the opportunity to have Elisa Minshew, who has spoken so kindly and eloquently and calmly, and which is certainly persuasive, and uh, I appreciate the way you've delivered the message. But, but I want to remind you what a tightrope we're walking when we start doing the, when we start bobbing around from, well, tonight we're feeling good and 
next week we're not feeling so good. And, and I want to um, also say that I personally did try because of, of I know how earnest the property owners are it were and uh, at the time in having this transaction occur. And I looked into, um, Mr. President, I looked into how could I assist in, in getting this on the agenda in a timely fashion. So it was a December event. And as Ms. Minchu said, I mean, it was just literally, um, it would have taken a breach of the rules of how we get things on an agenda. And um, the parties were, were regretful. They weren't, uh, they, they were not at all antagonistic. They understood it was, it was a process that had to be respected. But I, I did look into it and to see what I could do. And so this news tonight that the, that the buyer has walked away is completely new to me. Um, also, I'm just going to ask, and I hope if, if, this is, if this is privileged information, then you and your clients can decide not to divulge it. But it sounds like a, a sale was about to be imminent. That was my understanding. We were going to go through this process, and it, it looked like everyone was going to come out somewhat whole. Um, so there was a contract and agreement in terms, and Ms. Minshew, were you the, if, if I'm curious, Mr. President, if Ms. Ms. Minshew was the attorney um, for that transaction or representing the buyers? I, I was representing the buyer, but we had a title company that was handling the closing on behalf of the buyer. Okay. And were there going to be proceeds at the end of the sale that would make it to net proceeds that to would make the, it to the Denman seller? To the Denman family, yes. Okay. Could you share what was the purchase price? Was it two, 250 265 but Two. there's a mortgage on the property too that had to be paid I think the net proceeds was going to be over a hundred to Miss Denman and which would help her to get out of bankruptcy okay all right I mean and you know what is it that that caused this buyer to, with the buyers, it was my understanding the buyer, and if Joe wants to talk, I welcome that. I thought the buyer was, was teed up, heading in the direction of... I of, think, you know... Uh, based on it, even the representation when I spoke with, right. with, with Joe. I, I uh, caution myself in how I say this, because I don't want to offend you. But... They were very clear a couple of days ago that having been, had the time over the holidays to really think about all that had happened with code enforcement, with the Architectural Review Board, with the City Council, that they just didn't really want to put their money out there and then they have the same red tape problems. That's what they told us. And so the contract was set to, we had to close today we had in the past had extensions to get through the next meeting and they laid the let us know a couple of days ago that they would not have any more extensions because they just didn't want to have to deal with the the stress of trying to deal with all these different levels of committees and approvals and um, and it's unfortunate because they own property on that same block where they ha were planning to build their residence, and now there's some suggestion they might not even do that. Um, okay. And I just want to uh, ask one other question. Did the ARB determine that structure to be a contributing structure or non-contributing? They contributing, okay. 1928. All right. And, and so demolition in, in the ARB's... Um, eyes as well as many of the historic preservationists and stewards of our community as we know hate to see absolutely a contributing structure they were going to look so that at wasn't it. even I mean it's it's coming up in the conversation but it was it's not even an option well actually it was because the cost to it was one of those 50 50 houses after the hurricane it, it had that standard applied to it and it's really basically just a shell right now um, and they were going to send their architects over to look at it to see. So we're scheduled to be on front of them again for that purpose to see what they would determine. And even though it's a contributing structure, even Mr. Bowden said that under these circumstances that he could see approving 
a demolition as long as the new owner would agree to build something that would have a similar facade on Government Street because that's what he was mostly concerned with. And so that's where we were heading with the buyer, that as long as they would agree to a similar front on their new building, that's what they wanted to do. But th they said, you know, th we don't really want to be under the gun to have to start building in two months. And, you know, there were just too many limitations on somebody that was to put that kind of money into a property. Unfo I, I'm, you know, it's unfortunate for all of us. That's right. why I've come up with this alternative where we're going to try to put together some volunteers to scrape the building and paint it so that it meets that standard for code enforcement, get a contractor to go pull a permit to get the steps approved. That way, everything related to this lien will have been cured. And it, it, the property will just have to sit there kind of in a mothball status until we can find a buyer. And Ms. Denman is ready to, to list the property again and, and try to find a buyer. And that's what we all need. So, so Ms. Minchie, we could, I mean, if, if that, if you were afforded, you and your clients were afforded that opportunity. Right. Um, as a, then there would be right now just temporary relief um, but with an understanding that this could completely resurface well any house in the district that's not been completely rebuilt is going to have the ability to decline again to the point of having a code enforcement violation I mean that's just you can walk around my block and you can see that I mean Jamie sat behind me empty for what four or five years um, but to deal with this lien this violation let's deal with that and and finish it how did you arrive how did your clients arrive at this asking price or this agreed upon purchase price uh, <clears throat> the first buyer that approached us was the what do you call them preservation. the preservation board that came up with that price um, they were interested in it, and they likewise walked away from the problems. Um, they came up with the 250. Right. All right. And there has not been any appraisals. No. Okay. I, I just want to say, and this does not apply just to this case, but I just want to please remind you that um, rehabbing, building. Um, residing and owning property in these cities historic districts is not for the faint at heart that's clear <laughs> that is clear but the alternative as I talked to mr. Bowden at the at the architectural review board is the alternative is you're gonna have houses that just continue to look like that and eventually will fall down because uh, historically the city has not taken the initiative to foreclose as mr. Messer has suggested and and then what do you do For, fortunately as I understand this administration is already the wheels are turning in um, developing a very enforceable um, X uh, one that might foreclosure process that will be um, expeditious and, but in uh, but in at least with the county what usually happens is up, upon the foreclosure they tear it down so if the city is going to take on the rebuilding process to rehabilitate these contributing structures after they foreclose then then I think you're gonna have to be finding some money somewhere for that because it's very expensive but I, I again that's a it's a longer debate and I don't want to take you there tonight um, we just need some relief we need to do what we can to get this this property moving forward into the economy have somebody there paying taxes to contribute to CRA uh, and I would appreciate the council's support of the motion. Dr. Pratt and then Ms. DeWeese. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this is a complicated one. Um, and I, I, I think that at this point, especially since the buyer has walked away, it does put the, the original recommendation in, in sort of a limbo. But um, I, I will say that um, I understand why the 
the special magistrate did not go down to the, the staff cost issue because we have sort of said, you know, somebody who's been living there, they, 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 they owe something to the neighbors that for, for what has happened in that neighborhood. And so I won't be supporting the substitute motion, but I do think some leniency is in order. And I think that it would be fair to say that, that we would, and I also think in addition to leniency, they need closure. They need to know so that if somebody does step up and say, hey, we do want to buy this, they will be able to say, okay, we're going to owe X dollars and, and we know where we are. And so I think that it would be fair to, to, to ask that, that they have the $10,000 as long as they correct the violation by, and I'm looking at the, the, the original date is February 1st, which I don't know that you could even begin to consider painting a house by then. And I'd say maybe April 1st would be a, a possible time in, at which at least to have started meeting, and I'm not sure all of the details of, of the corrections that are necessary, but I think that that would be, be a fair goal to say, you know, April 1st, and, and if they can get that done, then, then $10,000, and then they're in the clear from us, and then they just need the Architectural Review Board's permission. So, and I, I don't want to confuse things by making a substitute, substitute motion, but once we get there. I'll reserve my comments until we take a vote on this because I had a completely different motion that I intended to make, so I'll okay. wait. Okay. So uh, we've got a substitute motion on the floor, and so we need to vote if that substitute motion becomes the main motion or not. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Two, three. Okay, so that's five, three. And... Uh, did you get the, the yeas and nays? No, his is the, you want clarification on that? Yeah, I need clarification. I'm sorry. Yes. I, I, I thought that we were, what were we just voting? Voting on his motion to become the main motion. Now we're going to vote on that motion itself. You could have voted to support that becoming the main motion and very well vote against it. You know, so it's two, two different issues and there. And will you clarify, the, the motion was 50? The motion, motion. was uh, that we uh, reduce, uh, eliminate the lien, the total lien, including the, the $10,000, uh, but have them be responsible for the 535 uh, by a certain date to get the property cleaned up. That was my motion, and, that, and I think Larry, you second. I second it, yes. And then. So I didn't make a motion because I didn't want to confuse having substitutes of substitutes. So I wanted to see whether that went before I said. So <laughs> this one passes, and it's a it's a done issue. If it doesn't pass, then the right. first motion becomes the main motion again. And then somebody could offer a substitute motion for that, right? Okay. I, okay. I do not support the substitute motion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or the main okay. motion now. Okay. Okay. So now uh, we've we've got the, the substitute motion as the main motion. I'm going to call for a show of hands. What's uh, the main motion? What you just said. Did, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Was there a date certain named, or he just said for a date certain? Did you give a date? Did, didn't you say April 1st? No, that was her date. By the that was my date. What, what was date? <laughs> All right. You did not? It's confusing. Okay. And give a date. We're voting to reduce the fine to 535. Give a date. As long as they I, I, clean it I up. I think it might be helpful. Uh, please. If, if we just please help. Read, <laughs> we just had the clerk perhaps read the motion that we're going to vote on so yep. everyone understands where we're going here. And, it, and my understanding is is to essentially eliminate um, the lien to the staff costs of $535 to be paid no later than April the 1st. No later than April the 30th. April the 30th. <laughs> And and if that was that not done, done be reverted back to the order. Then the clock starts ticking again as... So April 30th. And to correct uh, what was in the original lien. Oh, right. 
Well, the, I'm, I'm just going to take a, a, a privilege of chair here and, and, and uh, say to two people I just think the world of uh, why I won't be, be supporting the, 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 the motion is, is, is because of what Mr. Spencer had said early on is two things. One is it's kind of the slippery slope that we get on. Um, I'm going, you know, going forward when we've just started this brand new process. That's issue number one. And then the other one is, is this has clearly been going on for some time, and there is needs to be some relief in sight for all the people in the, in the neighborhood. I don't think there was anybody in here that was ill intentioned, you know that. Uh, um, and and I'd, I, I wished I could tell my good friend Joe out there that I, that I, I could support that. But uh, as it is now, and I'm not saying there's not another motion out there I wouldn't support over the original one, but I'm willing to give the special magistrate's recommendations um, um, first consideration tonight. Okay. So all in favor, uh, raise your hand. Okay. Can't be the only one. <laughs> okay. There's one in favor. All opposed? So that fails on a 1 8 vote. Okay. We're back to the main original motion. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I do appreciate uh, Ms. Minchu coming in and with great detail discussing the alternative option here. Um, and like you said, this is a slippery slope. We, we have a new process in place. We are years ahead of where we were with our old process with the board trying to make those decisions. And I simply do not want to undermine that. We as a council need to look at the big picture here. This is a painful case to try to make a decision on. It's a house that's been in the family for many generations. So this isn't a personal decision at all. It's one that I think we need to look at as a council for our processes that we have in place. So I'd like to make a substitute motion um, subject to the special magistrate's approval of the new dates that the attorney has offered. And I don't know if you have those in writing at this point to give to the clerk because I do not remember all of the dates that you gave. Uh, I was said April 1st to correct, June 1st to either demolish, uh, you know, as an alternative, June 1st to demolish or sell. Um, and then the $10,000 to be paid by the end of the year, uh, calendar year 12. So that's my substitute motion, subject to concurrence of the special magistrate. Okay. Okay. Got a substitute motion and a second, Ms. Dr. Pratt. I just wanted some clarification about how the process works. My understanding is if we reduce the lien to 10000 they have until they sell the how I mean we don't need that end of the year thing is that or or we'll only do it if they promise to pay by the end of the year I, I think that's up to you okay right we'd certainly prefer it to be indefinite <laughs> but we were trying to play to mr. Ray's end okay. date okay I would certainly love it if it was final forever and mm -hmm. we'd know okay. that would be great I understand thank you Mr. Gerald. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. You know, and I agree with Ms. DeWeese on her comments because I was under the impression that the special magistrate would handle these items for us and that we would support his recommendations and not attempt to undermine or second guess what he sends before us. And, and I'm in favor of letting the special magistrate handle our code enforcement issues and we move forward it's a new procedure it's something that we're attempting to do let's let's see if it works let's give it an opportunity to work versus sitting here for hours discussing it and then send it back to him again where it belongs in the first place let's be sensible here if it, this is his recommendation this is his request let's follow it and we'll give that procedure an opportunity to work and we can keep our questions for another day another time Thank you. Well said, and I, I, I will, will support uh, Ms. Deweese's substitute motion. Anybody else have comments? Yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Council President uh, Hall, one thing that, that I do need to, to clarify, if, if you're going to vote on this motion, uh, the property currently is in violation and is still in violation and is still accruing a $25 per day fine. Uh, if, if it's April 1st is the... Uh, 
the, the date that the, the, the things are going to be corrected, that's still another $2,000 worth of fines that are accruing on the property Mr. until Weiss, that point. Mr. did your motion include the, the fines being capped at 10000 Capped, but that the um, the issues be addressed. Up on those those dates. Those so dates. My, my understanding is those fines would not still accrue between now and April 1st. That's what I well, needed to clarify. Well, I, that this this stand, this recommendation stand, it's just the dates that are changing yes. to accommodate the loss of the purchaser. Yeah, my understanding would be that it would they, the fines would continue to accrue, and if on April 1st they didn't do what they needed to do, then the fines would now be two thousand dollars more. But if they did what they needed to do, ten thousand, and they go home. Was that your intent? Um, I'm not the special magistrate, so I don't know the the to the letter of what he was enforcing there. I mean, the recommendation was for the 10, but it makes sense that um, if it does not, if it's not cured by the date certain, then it was still accruing and continuing. So does your 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 motion then include that? Okay. Can right. I, uh, just to help you, if I could just read his words, that in the event that none of these things happen, he says, the original fine amount shall be automatically reinstated and shall continue to accrue unabated. Okay, so that means from continuous, it doesn't right. alter those dates. So I'm not changing the body of the recommendation. I'm simply substitute motion to accommodate the new dates requested okay. by the okay. owner. Great. All right, so we need to vote on whether the substitute motion becomes the main motion or not. All in favor, raise your hands. Okay, that passes unanimously. 8-0, Mr. Townsend is absent. That's now the main motion. Are there any comments from the uh, audience on this? Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hands. It passes unanimously. 8-0, Mr. Townsend, absent. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Minshew. I'm sorry I was talking. Did you approve it? We did. Thank you so much. Yes. And uh, roll tide. Hey, now, wait. I changed my mind. <laughs> Mr. Reynolds. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the second thing on our agenda at this point is the special magistrate recommendation request for lien reduction at 1701 West Intendencia Street. The recommendation is that City Council approve a recommendation from the special magistrate to reduce the recorded lien against the property located at 1701 West Intendencia Street and authorize the mayor to execute the appropriate documents. Move to approve. Second. second. Motion and a second. Thank you, Mr. President. I know I'm talking a lot about this, and I will support this uh, recommendation from the special magistrate, but I was very concerned about the commentary in this letter um, about the homeowner not being able to be contacted. As a property owner, the address of record, that's the property that's in disrepair, and um, I, although I'm not certain, I feel that the documentation and the efforts made by our staff were adequate. Um, and that it is responsibility of the property owner to make themselves available, either if there's a mailbox there or to forward an address for a post office box or an alternate address. So I do not um, see that this should have been reduced at all, but again, I'm not the magistrate, and I know they took a great deal of time to do it. So I would, uh, along the lines of what Dr. Pratt said, that the, if the property is in disrepair, there's an amount owed to the owners in the area for the, the property being in the state that it's in. So I'll support it tonight, but I think we move forward cautiously with that. Anyone else? Anyone from the audience? Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes 9-0. Thank you. For Mr. Chair? Yes. Mr. Chair, I'm going to make a motion that we fix the time to adjourn, date specific, <laughs> Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Second. Uh, we've got a motion and a second, and that's yeah. not that's not debatable. Um, I will say from the chair is that, and it has nothing to do with the BCS championship tonight between Alabama and, and, and LSU. My wife has been in surgery all day today, and it, it was not likely that I was going to get down here for the start of the meeting. I had text going to uh, Mr. Townsend, phone calls, emails about the beginning of the meeting talking to Miss Miss Major and I finally got her at home at 245 today left her on the couch in the care of my brother and but as a as a as a husband I needed to I just feel the need to Mr. Townsend we're gonna need your vote excuse me 
yes. Okay, I've said all I'm going to say. <laughs> Any other discussion on that? Yes. MGT, MGT is here. Mr. President, if yeah. I may, we have. That's right. Okay. Well, Mr. Uh, Reynolds, would you have an objection if 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 I could convince Mr. Johnson to remove his motion? If we um, before we um, will dispense of the one on Intendencia Street, we're just in, and and then uh, go to the disparity study. No, I'll. I'll uh no, I, 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 my motion stands. Okay. If the chairman leaves, can't the vice chair take over? We have Mr. Smith here from Tallahassee, and we were looking forward to hearing from, on the Wait. Why can't? I'm just asking procedure. Could yeah, the yes. Chair not oh, oh, absolutely. But I was I was speaking to uh, Mr. Johnson's motion there, so that he had made. I'll withdraw my second. Okay, withdrew his second, and. Uh, Anybody else second Mr. Johnson? No. Okay. Mr. Townsend, you, but you were about to leave, right? Yes. Okay. And so if I do depart, um, then it would go to the senior person on council, and that would be either Mr. Gerald's or Mr. Wu. Which one is, who is it? Mr. Gerald's. Gerald's, Mr. Gerald's. Okay. All right. Item number three, sir. Mr. President, the next thing on the agenda is a request for license to use right-of-way Woodland Heights Neighborhood Association. The recommendation is that City Council approve the request for a license to use a portion of the Ash Drive right-of-way. Move the approval. Second. So, mm -hmm. Any discussion from the audience? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Item number four, sir. Mr. President, item number four is Resolution authorizing the initiation of conflict resolution mediation with the City of Gulf Breeze in Escambia County. The recommendation is that City Council approve the resolution authorizing the initiation of Florida governmental conflict resolution sure. process required in Chapter 164 Florida statutes regarding the dispute between the City of Pensacola, Escambia County, and City of Gulf Breeze and enforcement of the City of Pensacola's exclusive franchise for transmission and distribution of natural gas on Pensacola Beach. Second. There is a motion and a second. You and I spoke about this briefly this afternoon. Um, um, you or Mr. Messer, um, I'd appreciate some comments from you tonight on that. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, essentially what we have here, and I'll put it in as frank layman terms as we have uh, possible, is that we have an agreement with the Scambia County that specifically says that we have the exclusive right to distribute gas gas. Uh, natural gas to all portions of the county except for the uh, town of Century. Uh, approximately uh, in 2007, we started the process of, 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 of executing a contract with the City of Gulf Breeze to allow them to provide gas to Pensacola Beach, which falls within our franchise exclusive agreement. Uh, at this point, uh, it's become clear as we've uh, negotiated through the process, the realization is, is that the City of Gulf Breeze is not going to move forward to execute that contract, and also that uh, the, the County of Escambia is not going to, do, to, to affirmatively look to keep our, uh, 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 our exclusivity uh, in place. And so as we looked at the uh, statutes in regards to what we are allowed to do, we can't in Florida simply just sue another municipality, we actually have to go into mediation beforehand. This begins that process. However, and I want to be clear, if we're not successful in mediation, this will all also allow the city to go ahead and file suit. And Mr. Messer can get in the details. <laughs> Sir? Well, I, I think at this point, uh, in simple layman's terms, it would appear that the city of Pensacola has been snuggered and the only way to remedy that is to initiate these procedures, which hopefully will lead to a dispute resolution, but if they don't, will lead to a lawsuit. And, and uh, you, you prepared a letter today for, for the legal parties, right? Yes, sir. Uh, I, please. Uh, Mr. Messer uh, uh, did go ahead and notify the attorneys for both uh, Scambia County and Gulf Breeze. 
uh, what the final position of the city was and, and what the steps were going to be in regards to where we were going to move forward to absent uh, affirmative action on their part. Uh, and essentially under Florida statutes, uh, once you vote on this on, on Thursday, if it comes to that point, then we have five days that we have to notify them in regards to what the next phase is. And that particular notification comes from uh, the, the uh, mayor's office and then uh, is forwarded to both organizations, uh, the head of their organizations. Okay, Dr. Pratt? I was just wondering, I know we never can tell how the courts will be, but if, if this goes into dispute resolution, what, what the time frame is, when might we have a resolution if it all goes well? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, basically, the procedure is that uh, five days after the um, dispute resolution uh, is approved, a certified letter has to be sent to the other parties that we have a dispute with. Within 30 days, we have what's called a conflict resolution meeting. Uh, which is to identify the issues and see if there isn't some way we can't resolve them without going to a public hearing. Then 50 days we have a public hearing. If the public hearing is not successful, we have to go to a mediation. If the mediation is not successful, uh, then the city can avail themselves of any legal remedies that, that uh, are extant. So I'd say it's probably about a 90-day process, presuming everything uh, goes according to Hoyle. And uh, the reason we do this is because it's the intent of the uh, legislature of the state of Florida that these issues be resolved as informally and expeditiously as possible without regard to litigation between political entities uh, in an effort to accommodate that. Uh, and, and I'll say without being self-serving that I think the city has been more than accommodating, but in an effort to go one more step uh, today, as Mr. Reynolds indicated, I sent a letter out to the respective attorneys uh, indicating exactly what we need uh, in order to resolve this matter, which is simply what the law requires and what the franchise uh, demands. And if those, um, that's simply the signing of a service agreement between ESP uh, and Gulf Breeze and the uh, signing of the uh, apportionment of our exclusive leaf, uh, lease to Gulf uh, Breeze. Uh, and if that's done within 20 days, then uh, everyone's made whole and we're good to go. If it's not, there's no other way to resolve it but to proceed with the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else on the committee from the audience? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes 7 0. Mr. Johnson and Mr. Townsend absent. Okay. Mr. Attorney, you have any communications or actions for us? No, sir. Okay. Uh, you have a... I have, I'd like to communicate with the attorney. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to, um, to remind you that we had discussed uh, looking at our animal control ordinances in relationship to the counties, and I'd like to get together with you sometime soon so we can do that. Uh, sure. What I'll do is uh, I'll call the county attorney. D do we want to do this with the county or just you and I to sort of... Well, I'd, I'd like to sit down and discuss with you in more, in more detail <coughs> what the problems are out in the community sure. regarding their enforcement or lack of enforcement of our ordinances. Sure. Why don't I, why don't I send you an email or call you tomorrow? We'll set up a meeting okay. this week. Okay, great. That'd be fine. I'll try to make you additionally proud of me. <laughs> I'm always proud of you. <laughs> so I'll be I'll just be looking for your email. I and promise. And we'll get together. Okay. Tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have a uh discussion item disparity study status report um verbal. Uh ladies, gentlemen. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening and afternoon. Uh, pleasure for us to be here to give you an update of the disparity study. Uh, with me is Ms. Uh, Hope Smith. She is our data manager, and she's responsible for all uh, the statistical analysis and data collection activities. Um, Do you want to catch the lights, Chris? 
what we have here on slide three, and I'll, I'll be brief. I know we've had a, a, um, a full, full day today, uh, but I do want to let you know that, uh, <clears throat> as you can see on this slide here, we have uh, 16 different tasks. Some of them run uh, concurrently. Some of them run consecutively. I uh, would like to say that uh, the disparity study, uh, we are on, still on schedule. We've had to adjust some timelines uh, within, the, within the schedule uh, to accommodate additional activities related to data collection and, and data analysis. Uh, but we're still scheduled to complete uh, the project in May, and we are about 40% complete. Uh, we started in, in August, really started in September. And as you can see, we have completed the first um, few activities related to uh, initiating the project, um, doing our legal review, and assessing the data, and we're in uh, the process now of uh, collecting the data. I will go through each task that we have, uh, have activity on and discuss those briefly. And then if you have any questions or want to talk about them in uh, more detail, and we do have some time uh, at the end of the presentation, or we can talk about them during the presentation, whatever, whatever is your pleasure. Uh, project management, uh, this is ongoing on a monthly basis. We, we talk with uh, our, our contract manager, uh, 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 Mr. Mayberger, uh, talk about the project status, where we are, what we're doing, uh, time last activities. We talk about those, the track and monitor activities of the study and uh, provide monthly uh, status reports on the study's activities. Uh, the legal review is in progress. We basically have completed the legal uh, chapter, the legal review chapter. Um, and uh, as we go along, any additional relevant court opinions issued uh, during the course of the study will be incorporated in the final draft. So basically, this, this chapter, the legal review, kind of stays open until we get toward the end of the, uh, of the project. Uh, but it is now uh, under review, and um, we will incorporate any comments uh, as we receive them. Uh, we have also completed uh, interviews with uh, city staff to have extensive knowledge of the procurement activities, procurement policies and procedures, and the SBE program policies and practices. So we have completed those interviews, and in the process of uh, incorporating those uh, comments uh, with the study. Assessing data, uh, this is, um, it's taken some time to do, uh, but basically we're looking at, at the procurement activities from October 1, 2005 through September 30, 2010. Uh, we've had follow-up meetings to assess and identify location of data. Uh, the storage of vendor subcontractor, uh, procurement and builder data. Um, we are currently reviewing existing procurement and payment databases and developing a methodology to uh, collect the utilization data if necessary. Uh, we're currently looking through bid files, uh, trying to identify subcontract information. Um, we've got uh, the invoice uh, payment history, so we do have uh, the information on primes. Uh, what we're trying to do now is identify and locate subcontractor data so that that will assist us in our subcontractor analysis. Um, I'll let Ms. Hope Smith talk just a little bit briefly about uh, what we have done so far with um, the data assessment, data collection activity, and then I'll pick up after that. Okay. Uh, yes. As Mr. Smith stated, uh, there's really two phases to this data assessment and collection. We did an on-site data assessment during the kickoff meeting, as well as did a follow-up um, conducting a short survey just to confirm the location of subcontracting data with the various departments who all responded so that we could get that information. Uh, also, what we've done as a follow-up to that now is that, as Mr. Smith stated, we're looking at the subcontracting data. Currently, what we have in-house is we do have the prime level spending of the invoice history. We've also collected some data that we'll be dealing with on the private sector side, which is the permits data. And while we're here tomorrow as well as we're going to look through some more bid files to see if we can find out um, just what additional information we can find there. Okay, thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, so as you can see, this activity takes some time to, to complete, but we have to make sure that we do our due diligence here uh, to make sure that when we do start our analysis that we have identified all the dollars, all the expenditures, 
and all the vendors and uh, the vendor data and the databases that we need in order to do our, our analysis because from that analysis will come our findings and recommendations. Um, in this, this slide here, we talk a little bit about the business categories of construction, of professional services, which include A&E, uh, other services, goods, and supplies. And at the subcontractor level, we're looking at construction, A&E, and professional services. Uh, and that's where data is available. Uh, we requested uh, VIN and, and prime sample data, invoice history files have been submitted to us. We have received, as Ms. Hope Smith just said, um, we have requested additional data and data fields we're requesting, and those have been provided. Um, and uh, we're trying to determine at this point whether or not there's any additional subcontracted data that's available for us to utilize in the study. And uh, we have um, um, sent surveys to department heads, as Ms. Smith said, uh, to try to determine whether or not there's any uh, additional files out there that may have the subcontract <coughs> data. To determine availability of qualified firms, uh, we developed a list of uh, area trade association and business organizations to request their membership list. Uh, that list has been provided to the city and approved by the city. Uh, our subcontractor will, will start requesting those membership lists this month, and, um, and that uh, analysis of uh, availability of qualified firms will be conducted at, at basically the, the prime and the subcontractor level. And this is a list of, um, I don't know why this slide is messed up like that. But anyway, this is a list of the organizations and uh, trade organizations and associations that we will be soliciting their membership list from. And basically what we do with this membership list is we take that list and, and try to uh, help us identify uh, ethnicity within our database so that when we start breaking out the analysis in the different buckets as far as which ethnicity has received the, uh, dollars, contract dollars, in the certain different years of the study, we'll be able to correctly identify that. Um, we have developed custom census surveys, um, and those surveys have been approved by the city. And what the custom census does is help us with our availability determination. Uh, we purchase data from Dunn and Bradstreet, uh, and then we pull a sample from that um, and call different vendors and ask them a, uh, a couple of names. The Dunn and Bradstreet data does not uh, have a couple of questions that we need to ask, whether or not you're interested in doing business with the, uh, with the city. Uh, also, we want to, to try to identify uh, ethnicity as when we talk to them as well. Uh, so those are a couple additional questions that we ask uh, during this survey activity. Uh, we plan to start that this month, January. Uh, our subcontractor, the diversity program advisor, will be conducting the custom census survey activity. And uh, we've also um, have obtained the uh, U.S. Census survey of business owners, we call it SBO data, for the Pensacola Ferry Pass, uh, Brent, Florida, Metropolitan Statistical Area. Uh, we will use that uh, as a source of availability as well. And as we've talked about earlier, before we can determine whether disparity exists, we have to look at the, the number of firms that are out there available that are ready, willing, and able to do business with the city. Then we look at your utilization, and then we determine if there's any disparity. So we go to great lengths to try to determine the availability of firms out there. Our anecdotal activity will begin. I have, I have, in I have a question for you on, on that. Okay. Is, you, know, you can give us a, a snapshot of available firms and then whether they're even thinking about doing business with the, the city or not, willing and able to do business with the city. Is there any way that you can capture where if policies have been different over the last 10, 15, 20, 25 years that there might be more businesses out there that would be eligible, or is that getting too subjective? Yeah, that gets, that gets pretty far back. Um, right. Right. Our study period, we try to look at what's happening during the study period yeah. to okay. give you that snapshot. Right. Okay. Good question. Our anecdotal activities will be starting up in February, um, and the anecdotal, anecdotal 
activities will include um, public hearings, focus groups, um, and uh, survey of uh, business owners. Uh, but basically, the, the whole purpose of the uh, anecdotal activities is to try to find out uh, vendors and, and, and business owners' experience in doing business with the city or trying to do business with the city, uh, what's their experience in working with prime contractors with the city, and uh, what are their experience in doing business in the private sector. Uh, we will do one-on-one uh, -on -one personal interviews with business owners. We'll conduct 40 of those. Uh, they'll be randomly uh, selected, uh, and the business owners uh, may volunteer to participate in these interviews. Uh, McCray and Associates will be conducting these interviews for us. We'll conduct one public hearing. That meeting will be open to the public, and what we will do is uh, post a legal notice in the, in the, uh, the local papers to invite the, the public to come out and, and share with us uh, their experience in doing business with the city or trying to do business with the city. Uh, we will have a court reporter there and we will record those uh, proceedings and then include those, um, those results in our analysis uh, as well. Um, basically, we'll be asking that the uh, business owners to provide public testimony uh, regarding their experiences. Uh, McCray and Associates will be coordinating that uh, public hearing and uh, working with uh, George Mayberger to find a suitable place to, to hold the public hearing. Um, and maybe we can, can hold, it, hold it here in City Hall. But we'd like to hold it somewhere that's uh, centrally located, somewhere that the public and business owners know it's easy to get to, and there's ample parking. Mr. President, I had a question. Sure. Is it typical that a third party be involved in that phase of it with our uh, staff having the information? Why is there a third party involved in coordinating those hearings? Um, well, the, basically, um, that person, the, uh, the third party is involved in, in helping set up the location, uh, room set up, um, provide uh, refreshments, uh, coordinate uh, phone calls, and and um, you know people just have information about uh, wanting information about what's what's the public hearing what's it all about where to attend whether or not um, we need to have uh, provide special provisions for anyone and that type of thing but what we do when we do these disparity studies um, as we go throughout the country we always um, we always get local subcontractors to help us with anecdotal activities uh, related to public hearings, uh, the one-on-one -on -one interviews, and the focus <coughs> groups, and uh, uh, the local surveys. And you pay that out of your fee? That's not an additional cost to the city? We pay that out of our fee. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. <laughs> Just to comment on that, I, I could see kind of the sense in it. I mean, it may not exist here in Pensacola, but, you know, the um, city staff may feel like they've got a vested interest in conducting things in a public way and by having a vendor do a microwave stand. So I, I think that's probably a wise thing to do. Right. And uh, a lot of times uh, when we have these meetings, uh, some vendors and business owners, you know, some are vocal, and they don't care where they are. They're going to speak their piece. And you have some that are reluctant. And if uh, city officials are there, they may they have a fear of retribution. Uh, if they say something negative or something that's not all I've got that my good back to the city. Sort of turn to you guys most of the time to watch, watch the presentation. Any of you want to just ask a question to just jump in there? Yeah. Okay. So there will be one public hearing. Uh, there will be two focus groups. Um, basically, um, both of these activities, MGT, will be conducting the activities. Our subcontractors just help facilitate and coordinate. But myself um, and um, a couple of other members of MGT staff will actually be conducting the focus groups, and we will be conducting the, the uh, public hearing. Okay, and we have scripts and we have uh, templates that we will be developing and sending to the city for them to review and approve. As far as the questions that we'll be asking, uh, and get your feedback related to that before we actually start the. Um, the activities. So for the focus groups, we have um, um, 
templates that we will be using. Uh, basically, in focus groups, we some people do not like to speak out in public, uh, like in a public hearing, but they will share information with you in a focus group. It's a, it's a closer setting, uh, anywhere from 15 to 20 participants. Uh, we have set questions that we ask. Uh, sometimes we go to these focus groups and uh, people just talk all over the, uh, you know, just a lot of, a lot of discussion, uh, have very good groups. There's some groups that go in that no one says anything. So we have to go into each group with uh, a set number of questions to ask to make sure that we're consistent over the focus groups and we get the information that we need from the focus groups. Um, uh, McCray and Associates will be uh, assisting us with the uh, focus group activity. Sir, we, we have reached our time, but I know everybody's interested in the rest of your presentation, so unless I hear objection, um, proceed on with that. But uh, um, after the, the presentation's over with, I'd like for council to um, um, set a time, or even if, if, even if you, you set the time as open-ended, um, um, for the amount of discussion afterwards. But we, we are past the 15 minutes now, but if there's no objection, please continue. Okay, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just fly through the rest of this. Um, survey of vendors, uh, AC advertising will be conducting a survey of vendors. Basically, this is a web-based survey followed up by telephone calls if we don't get the responses that we need. Um, then we uh, pull a random sample uh, from our database uh, to make sure that all, all ethnic categories and business categories are reflected. We will be conducting an analysis of the relevant private market. In other words, we'll be looking at the uh, what, what primes are doing in the private market as, as well as what they're doing in the public market, public sector, and try to determine whether or not there's any, um, basic trying to see if the primes are utilizing uh, a minority of small business subcontractors in the private market, in the private sector, as well as the public sector. So we compare the two, especially we can find uh, prime contractors that are working in both markets. We want to look and see what's happening consider the nexus. We will order our reconstruction data, which is construction data that we can order. It tells us about the private sector and uh, commercial uh, activities. Um, we receive commercial permits from the city, and we will be trying to identify, uh, collect commercial permits from the Scammy County as well. Next steps is that uh, Submit the, uh, the legal chap chapter for review and comment has been done. Uh, order reconstruction data. We will develop a data collection plan if necessary. Uh, determine availability of the commercial construction uh, permits for Scammy County. Uh, conduct the uh, con custom census surveys and uh, begin the anecdotal activities. So that in a, in a nutshell is where we are. But like I said, the overarching uh, message I wanted to convey with you today is that uh, the disparity study is on time and we will complete it by May uh, and that we're about 40 percent done and that's where we would normally be at this period of time and right now we have not found any major obstacles or hiccups that will prevent us from completing a project on time. Thank you sir and and I would like I would before we get into the discussion I would like a motion from somebody on council the amount of time or no time limit at all um, um, to discuss where we are. Um, I, I'll make the motion that we uh, limit the time to 15 minutes. 15 minutes, that's the mo motion. Second. second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Mr. Gerald, you opposed? No. no. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I, okay. All right. Pull that right. down. So that when that you passed that. unanimously. Mr. Gerald. Thank you. Um, Mr. Smith, if you would, for us, uh, once again, folks, we're spending two, a quarter of a million dollars to do this. And I believe there needs to be a bit of clarification as to, well, obviously, you're doing it because we contracted with you to do so. So the reasons why are largely our purview of, of understanding. But there continues to be a misunderstanding as to the process and uh, there are some people out there who think that this disparity study relates to the population, but it, as I understand it, it is the business population 
of the city of Pensacola, not the African American or minority population that lives in within the city of Pensacola, but rather those who engage in business. Is that pretty much the basis of, of what you're doing? That's correct. We're looking at the business population uh, and looking at the procurement activities that the city have with the business population related to this study period. So then questions concerning employment practices and other things outside of business per se can be dispelled or should be dispelled as not a part of what you're doing, is, is that correct? It's not a part of what we're doing, but we could certainly add it. <laughs> for some money, right? For some consideration. Well, yeah, for some yeah. For small fee. With that, well, we got an arm and a leg getting this thing already. Would that <laughs> involve any more money to to add yeah. those? Yes, because that's a that's a different that's a different study and that, a different set of data. Okay. Well, what I wanted to share with council, those of us who are present, <laughs> is that um, we did a pre disparity study. I believe that was in '09. 08, 09, and we started in 08, and we got the report in 09, I believe, if I'm correct on that. I remember in March of 09. I can look it up. Okay. I think that's what it was. Okay. But in any case, I think we're, we're looking at uh, ways of improving uh, the way we do business here in the city of Pensacola. But there are a couple of models that I would suggest that people take a good look at, and the one in the city of Chicago, and I don't know if you guys had anything to do with that. There's one in uh, the city of Tampa and in Atlanta. Well, the purpose of doing the disparity study is to find out where we are in the city of Pensacola. And uh, in addition, I've been told that the disparity, the results will give us a, a basis of, of being able to go to court if there are challenges in terms of the recommendations that we may want to implement. But also it gives us an opportunity to, um, as a council, to create an ordinance that would assist the city in doing business and that ordinance based on your findings and recommendations that ordinance would give us an opportunity to move forward in a positive way versus uh, looking at a study and I've encouraged the general public to be prepared to deal with the results either if they're in favor or against what we thought if we find at some point uh, where you know there have been comments about disparities in the city but if the study comes back and say that none were identified, we need to be prepared as a city to move forward and determine what we're going to do with the results of the, the study that we receive, whether it's for or against what we think or what we would like to do. And I do believe that at, at a price tag of a quarter of a million, $250,000, we need to be prepared as a council and as a city to move forward with those results. And that's what I encourage uh, people to, to look at, and we as a council must focus on that because we don't want to be accused uh, in the future, as we have been in the past, of doing studies, getting results, and then putting it on a shelf and doing nothing with it. And I think a quarter of a million dollars would be ridiculous to take, to spend on a study and then do nothing with it, take no action at all. Because if we were planning to do that, and, and until we can generate not only the interest in this, on this council, but the interest in this city, to move forward in a positive direction, to do something positive with the results that we get from you guys. And if it tells us where we are, what we're doing, if it comes with, and I'm sure that it will, if it comes with recommendations of how we may remedy the concerns or the issues that we have and move forward. And that's basically what I'm looking forward to, us as a city, accepting those results and being able to move forward. Thank Thanks, you. sir. Dr. Pratt. Thank you, and I just had a, uh, question or request for information that um, I know there were a lot of hearings and opportunities for people to be involved and I'm hoping that you will share it with the administration and the administration will share it with us so that we can reach out because we we know many people who might want to have say and so just requesting that information be flowing and get the right contact information. Great, thank you. You know, and I'd, I'd add, add to that, just us knowing, even if we are not recruiting people or disseminating the information, uh, Looney Rick's Kiss, when they came here to do their uh, CRA um, study, it was, a, it was a really big help to me to be able to go in there and look at the process that they, they were engaged in, you know, whether it was with city staff or other elected officials or with the, the general public. Just just knowing um, the process that you guys were going through. Maybe not every single detail, but certainly with the public hearing. Okay, and we will be uh, publishing notices with the dates and times and places 
for these activities um, and we'll share that with you. Uh, a lot of times we recommend that the municipality post them to the website so that people can access those, those dates as well as notices that we'll be sending out um, to, the, to the business owners based on the databases that we have. Okay. Anybody else on committee? Ms. Dubasan. Yes, thank you. First, I want to thank the uh, organization for remaining. I know they've been here all day and for uh, enduring with the conversation that we had in, in advance of their preparation. I had a couple of quick questions. Uh, I saw the date September 2010. That would say to me that the most current year for which this administration and our current policies would be accountable is not being included in this study. And I was wondering where that conversation transferred from the five most recent years to have a one-year gap um, who made that decision and is there any way we can regain that so that we would have the most current year included in our um, analysis um, the second thing would be the organization lists um, will those be of a concurrent time period to the data uh, on the contracts or are you talking about current organization lists of of available and, and population individuals. In other words, if it was in 2008, will you be com comparing those contracts issued that year with those available in 2008, or, or will it just be current um, lists? I was unclear about that. And the third party facilitation, that seemed to be a little issue for some people here. I am delighted to see because I found that when the Looney Kiss, whatever that group was here, staff was directing who was being invited to the sessions and there was a very skewed presentation. A lot of citizens who wanted to be present in those meetings were denied access and had to wait until the end of the day when the community neighborhood meetings were held. So I think it is important that we have that separation because sometimes rather than seeing the actual picture, we see the picture that we want to see of ourselves so I, I salute this organization for having put that level in there but I, I would be curious as to why 2011 fiscal year is not included and if there's any way that that could be brought in were you, were you able to capture all those questions uh, yeah I think I did okay I think I did the the <laughs> uh, the five re the five years um, when we, we you know we've been talking about disparity study for a while and uh, so when we finally um, looked at it at that time the uh, fiscal year 2011 um, was not available we didn't know if it would be available so we always go with the most complete year sometimes you have end of year procedures and and uh, things that you have to do to close the books for that year and so when we started uh, basically we wanted to go with the last completed year um, now we can have discussions about that uh, and include that year um, if, if that's what we need to do, we need to do that now before we start our analysis and then drop off the 2006 year and do 2007, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, we, we can do that uh, as, long as, as long as we do that now before we get into the, mm -hmm. the crunching of the numbers. We just have to ask for additional data uh, and we'll see where that, where that goes. But if that's, if that's the wishes, uh, we can we can certainly entertain that. Ms. Tube's son, did they get all of them? No, sir, but uh, th that that is one of my concerns is that, you know, I understand the contract was led in September and we were a few days away from the end of the fiscal year when this contract was approved, but since we have not reached the point of the numbers actually being done there and we're talking about fashioning a process from this point forward, I think it would be important to capture what this administrative group has done, considering all of the new policies that have already been brought into place, so that if we see a four-year process where, you know, one set of numbers are there, and in the fifth year under new processes, we've had some positiveness that we might not need to do let as much changing you, as we let might. Let me ask you this. Just stay, stay until we start doing the new business part of this you know, to get things on, on the agenda. And if uh, the, the committee uh, wants to go the extra mile to include that, I'm sure there's going to be some adjustments and a price tag that, that comes with it. But anyway, uh, we, we can talk about that then. I think he just said that if you give him the direction now, since they have not captured and expanded this information, they could make that change now, perhaps. Um, I, well, I don't, I don't know about everybody else. I'm not prepared to do that change tonight. All right. I understand okay. that it's an urgent decision to be made, and yeah. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Mr. President, if I may, yes. uh, and, and that's something we would have to ask Mr. Dick Barker 
uh, in regards to our financials to make sure right. that they are actually at a place where we could do that. But otherwise, I don't think there would be any objection from uh, the mayor's office. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, the lady by Miss Georgia Blackman. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Oh, I'm Eleanor Johnson. Thank you for the opportunity. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about the disparity. We've been getting uh, reports from the EBO um, about the participation of minorities on the work site. And at a glance, um, in looking at the money, there's a disparity there in terms of some of our lead minority companies have had to fall under a subcontractor uh, status. And I'm a little concerned about that in terms of where the dollars are really going. It's fine that we have, I think, 35% minorities on the work site, but when you're looking at $45 million and they're getting 5%, that's a huge disparity. So I would like to know if you could address that. And um, also, who and um, who, gives, who gives you your data in terms of some of the businesses that you listed, uh, like the county school board? Uh, is that based on how many minorities are doing business with the school board? Because at the present time, they have quite a few RFPs out for uh, contracting the food services, um, uh, computer labs, and how do you get your data to know whether how many minorities apply for uh, being able to be contractors to the school board? You know, just who do you talk to at the school board to get those numbers? Okay, uh, the school board is not part of the study, um, but we are trying to, we request lists of uh, prime and subcontractors to assist us in identifying who's, who's participating in working with the city. Uh, but uh, we normally contact purchasing directors and uh, <clears throat> different associations to, to get our list, but the, the school board uh, is not part of the study and the, the county is not part of the study. I think at one time uh, they were uh, being uh, considered as coming as a consortium uh, to have several uh, entities uh, in the study, uh, but that didn't happen. So this is strictly the, uh, the city of Pensacola. Okay, and the list of businesses that you just displayed, those are a list of trade associations and organizations that we will be requesting membership lists from to assist us in identifying the ethnicities uh, of firms that, that we will have in our database. Okay, thank you. Okay. And regarding your stuff on the Maritime Park and the EBO effort over there, that's just really, it, I'm not saying it's not important, but that's looking down at the micro level rather than the big picture level. And so I, I don't know if you want to address that or not, but it, I, it, on how one specific project is being done, you're looking more at uh, the aggregate out there. We're looking, we're looking at everything, but um, you know, we're looking at the dollars that the city spend for uh, contract uh, activities, procurement activities. Um, yeah. Excuse me, if, if, if I understand right, that's one of our biggest projects for minority workers and contractors, correct? That's right. one of the biggest projects that the city of Pensacola has participated in, in terms of having minority lead. That, that, that's, that, that, that's true, and, and, and anybody else can chime in here, but I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at you at the scope of the study, is not to evaluate just one project, but over how the money overall is spent. We're looking at every dollar that's been spent um, by the city in contract opportunities for right. the study period. Okay. Ms. Dubasan, just, just one minute. No, no, come on up. Just one minute, and because we're at our 15 minutes. Yes, sir. I just wanted to quick clarification. My understanding, though, is that the Maritime Park Project is a separate entity, and so they probably wouldn't fall under this study. The, the efforts of that board in their contracting is not how the city contracts, and so that's not part of this study, is uh, my understanding. We've had, we've had several meetings today uh, trying to determine what, uh, how this... <laughs> CMPA mm -hmm. deal works and how the dollars flow and whether or not there are any city dollars that are being spent for that project. Um, and we have been told based on our discussions today that there are no city dollars that are being spent for that project. And there was, uh, and I, I guess the city can uh, probably address this a little bit better than me at this point, 
but there, there were some reimbursement activities um, that involved city dollars, but those dollars have been repaid. And that project, the CMPA project, is separate from the city and no city dollars are being spent okay. there. Okay, okay Ms. Uh, uh, Mr. Gerald, do you want to speak before Ms. Dubasan? Yes, uh, okay. just a couple of quick remarks. Then that, having heard uh, that comment that the the, C, the uh, Maritime Park project won't be included in, this, in the results of the study, then that does not allow the activity and the fluff numbers that we've been, fluffy numbers I should say, that we've been getting from the uh, EBO won't skew the results of your study. Because that project, as you pointed out, is going to be excluded from the final tally of what's going on. Well, is that what you're telling us? Well, I, no, we can't ignore it, okay, <laughs> because it's too big of a project. Okay. Um, but what we can do is look at it from our private sector analysis. Okay. okay. That's what we're doing. We're clearing the clearing okay. the air, okay. clearing the air, so we'll have a better understanding. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Dubasan. Myers. Well, I just wanted to point out that even though the CMPA is a separate entity, they do have a contract with the city to develop that park. So that is a contract that we are engaged in. For this organization to build a project for us, so the city is very much a part of it. It's a contract. They have a master development contract and a master lease agreement with the city. So that I, I think it needs to be looked at because that's the contract we have, with, even though it is a separate entity, supposedly. I understand. We we are, you know, we are. We're working with you on this, <laughs> but we try, we follow the dollar, okay? We follow the dollar for the study period. And so if the city hasn't spent any dollars for that study period, it doesn't show up in the databases that we requested. Okay, now, now we're, we're five minutes over, so if I have no objection, I'm gonna extend the time by another five minutes. Okay, Dr. Wu. To help you out and help you out other people's thinking, what's happened is, is the money's been giving, given to private companies. And you're taking a look at what the private companies have done. Mm -hmm. It would be unfair to clobber the city for not spending that money where they should have when it's the private companies that are making those contracts. And, and so I think that's what you're trying to say to the group, to, to take that, the public, and then convert it to a public thing it would not be fair in the analysis, right? If I hear you correct, right? Because the, the, we're, we're we're analyzing the dollars that the city is spending uh, for businesses, okay? So for that study period, we're looking at every dollar that you spent with the business in this market, the relevant market area. So if you don't have any city dollars going to the Maritime Park project they won't be in the databases that we requested, the invoice payment history. That's, uh, that's what we requested, invoice payment history. We had several meetings today on that because we wanted to know where were those dollars, where were the, the Maritime Park dollars because they were not in our invoice payment history. And we were told, like I said, we're still investigating, we're still doing our analysis, but we were told after we met with several people that there are no city dollars being spent on the Maritime Park. Therefore, that's why they didn't show up. But we can include some analysis of what's going on there if they cooperate, and we have to do that through the city uh, for the private sector analysis. Back, back to the question that I had originally asked about the organizational list. Um, Ms. Johnson also referred to it. I, I'm hoping that the um, <coughs> census that you use of each organization is compared to the membership available in the year for which the contracts are being looked at as opposed to the current list of available companies that five years ago were not able to respond. So that, that was the one question that I didn't get answered. And then in reference to what Ms. Myers did say, I believe there is a contract between the city and the CMPA and that they have used the city purchasing 
in order to get better buys for the CMPA. So there has been this back and forth contracting and subcontracting between the two entities, and I believe it would be accountable if you were to look at 2011, which is why I raised the issue of why are we not looking at 2011, because there was quite a bit of activity where the city acted on behalf of the CMPA and then was reimbursed according to some ratio that was set up. So I would really encourage the council and Mr. Smith and the uh, administration to review if we want a clear picture if the city is in fact contracting with groups in the name of the city of Pensacola and we are paying it out of our treasury whether it's reimbursed later on or not it is an action of this city that we are supporting that that maybe should be looked at as well thank you thank you and thank you sir you okay. could have a final word uh, no she just asked something about availability um, the, the courts have accepted um, utilizing availability dollar uh, firms uh, in the the current year of the study uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to go back five years from now and determine how many firms are out there available, uh, willing and able to do business. Therefore, uh, it's, it's acceptable practice to use uh, the availability numbers that we come up with now. I have a follow-on question to that. Would it not be uh, part of what the city would have with their SBE or MBE or WBE list from that year that you could use? Is that not typically used? Uh, it, most most um, most municipalities have a running tally. It's, it's not by year and business can come and go during that period of time. You know, might have somebody that was available in 2005 that's not available now. But I think the concern Ms. Dubison has, and I now have that concern because she brought it up, it's that some of those businesses might be uh, out of business uh, either for not having business from the city or just because of conditions that have come in the past few years, but that we be able to look at them because that's who was affected in that year, not the ones now. Yeah. Um, that's difficult to do. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. To the consent agenda items, we have four. No? Do we have any? Which one? <laughs> okay. So for the the consent agenda um, <coughs> item, eight zero. Yes. Um, all four of the items that were under mayor communications and actions. Should I read them each one individually? You're okay. supposed to. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have special magistrate recommendation request for a lien reduction, 417 East Government Street. That passed at uh, 8 0. That was a substitute motion. It was uh, um, as captured by the clerk. And uh, special the second one is special magistrate recommendation request for a lien reduction at 1701 West Intendencia Street. That passed unanimously. Item number three, request for license to use right of way, Woodland Heights Neighborhood Association. That also passed unanimously. And resolution authorizing the initiation of conflict resolution mediation with the City of Gulf Breeze and Escambia County. Mm -hmm. That also passed unanimously. Move the approval. Second. Okay. Motion, second. Discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. you have anything on the information item or wish to discuss? I'll just get with staff directly to try to understand. That was actually one of the, the ordinances on the books that I had questioned to begin with. Okay. So I, I just wanted to know why we're using it instead of just creating a new um, ordinance. Okay. Council Communications and New Business. Yes, Ms. Myers. Um, I know there were <coughs> some people here tonight that thought that we were going to have a discussion on the status and future of our Environmental Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. uh, and... I would like to have that issue put on the next agenda 
Uh, so I'm going to make a motion that uh, we um, have an update and discussion on the status of our environmental advisory board. I'll second. second. Okay. Well, uh, it, unless there's an objection, I don't see a need for us to vote on that. Is there any objection to that? Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Anybody else? Anybody? Oh, Ms. Yes, Doris. Thank you, Mr. President. And I did say that I'd wait until later to um, continue discussion on the issue that the citizens brought up during Boyd Forum. Out of respect for the council members that are not here, uh, I do not have a motion at this time. Um, I do feel like I, I should at least share my thoughts, having been president for the first year sure. of this new charter. It's an impossible situation we find ourselves in. Um, it has reflected negatively on us as a city and uh, undermined the trust of the citizens and council as a whole, um, but specifically the actions that you had taken during the meeting. And I know um, the, the hindsight, the, you know, the, the Monday morning quarterback or whatever you want to call it, of looking at possibly a better way to have dealt with that situation, and I do understand that you were working to maintain decorum and the processes, also to protect the processes and position and standing of this council. Um, but what did happen was unacceptable um, in, in my eyes, but um, ultimately in the citizens' eyes. And, and from tonight's discussion, um, and even online, there are almost 700 people that have signed a petition, um, and you've lost their trust. And I don't want us as a council to be put in the position of having to make that decision for you. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate because it wasn't an action of council, it was an individual action. Um, so I do not have a motion tonight. I would just urge you individually to consider what has happened here and the healing that could happen from a decision that you make yourself and that we all can move on as a council, as a city. Um, and not that there's a reset button because it, it was very upsetting what happened. Um, and we obviously can't erase the, the nail hole that's in the fence. You can remove the nail, but the hole remains. And um, I just ask you to consider that from one yeah. human being to another. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Ms. Myers. Yes. Um, first of all, I, I want people to, uh, to understand that uh, Councilman Hall is a friend of mine. He represented my district, and we loved him. He did a great job for us. We couldn't have had anybody better. And I would not have run for this position had Mr. Hall continued to represent us. So it's with a lot, a lot of sadness in, in my heart that I, I too, make, would ask you to, to consider uh, re resigning. I, I've been inundated with emails from all over the country. Uh, letters, uh, phone calls uh, from people regarding this matter, even uh, from people outside of the country, and saying, if I ever come to the United States, I won't visit Pensacola. And I write back and I tell them, you know, the truth about how we really operate here with our open forums. But the, the president is the face of the council, really. And I think it's really important that the public uh, trust the council. And a lot of that trust comes from who is sitting in the seat of the, the the, the president. Um, however, I, I, I believe uh, when I was a, just a citizen and also from my observations on city council that the city council and our government don't really understand what the First Amendment actually means in terms of the citizens' rights uh, to petition their government. Uh, we are the government. Uh, every employee who works here is the government. And there are some su Supreme Court cases and federal court cases that address th these issues. Um, I've had concerns over uh, 
when I was just a private citizen of people being vilified by city council members because they were engaged in a petition drive or just uh, talked about inappropriately in the press and on, and on the radio. When public officials do that, that has what the courts call a chilling effect on a person's constitutional rights. So we have to be very careful what we do. I have to remind myself that I am the government. And the, the case law is well established on what right citizens have to petition their government. There are a lot of things I hear citizens say that I don't like, some of them about me personally, but, and I have the right to defend myself in the appropriate way. Uh, but um, I really had to think long and hard about whether I wanted to run for city council because I knew if I did, I was opening myself up to allowing people to say a lot of things about me that they have a right to say just because I'm the government. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, I, I am going to ask you, based upon all of the, uh, I, I do know the mayor got a lot of uh, emails because I made an open records request for them. So I would like for you to uh, really consider, uh, you, you know, um, and well, if, if, I don't want you to take take it personally. I, I, it's Ms. Myers, mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't take it personally. It, it it really does not hurt my feelings at all. And quite frankly, you out of all the people on council, I'd be most disappointed if you didn't say what you said. And and so I I do take all 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 of that that to heart. And and as far as having thick skin um, goes, um, I I think I developed that pretty much in my first year on on council people ask how you deal with it and you just grow that thick skin in fact uh the last committee of the whole meeting uh, my thin was so thick that i wasn't being moved by remarks to final solution and 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 uh i'm treating the the, the homeless um like jews were in germany and poland and russia um, back right prior and during uh, World War, War II, and, and even the questioning on people's religious faith. Um, you know, um, I've, I've had people actually say much worse to me at, in, in private uh, uh, about how dare I be um, a, a Christian. You know, with all the evil that Christianity has done over the last 2,000 years, how could anybody possibly identify with that that faith but when three council members spoke up and 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 the former president had it reminded us of the um, decorum that that that's required here that's when that's when i responded not because of myself but in protecting the or, or t trying to protect um uh the decorum regarding council as far as the um, um, being able to suspend anybody's First Amendment rights, it's not in my power to do that. And I think what happened um, after that meeting with the 200,000 hits on, on YouTube, you know, that my, my son called me up from Washington, C.C., and says, how does it feel to be a celebrity? I didn't even know that he had... He had, he, had, he had seen the, 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 the video. I had to tell my other two kids about it because they didn't know what he was talking about. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, he said, how's it uh, um, I feel to be a celebrity? Well, there were some remarks that came out of there that were, that were personally hurtful and really made me step back and an examine um, 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 what I did on that, la that Thursday night. In, in, in December, um, um, if I had my, like you said, uh, Miss uh, Dewey said, it hindsight's 2020. If I could hit the rewind button, I would have handled things differently than than what I did. Um, and uh, but I, one of the things that 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 I found remarkable 
is just what an exercise that was for many people in this country and how one person, even in a position of authority, president of the city council, whatever that means, to um, suspend anybody's First Amendment rights. This is a great country, it's a great community, and, and I think that, that perhaps the, the word that, in points that Reverend Monk wanted to make, were given much more visibility. And I do regret that it's had a, a negative impact on, on the, the city of Pensacola. I take to heart both of you's request, the many people that spoke out to today's request, and I will continue to. I have not made a decision, and uh, I hope that you guys don't vote to, to, to remove me. But uh, uh, I will tell you this, if I remain in office, I, will pro I, I promise to do better and do what Ms. Dubasan asked me to do on that Thursday night. She told me to count to three, and, and I'll count to 10. Um, 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 before that that happens but uh, um, so there was one gentleman that called me I'm not sure where he was from I took his phone call and he was a very nice guy I mean it was it was quite contrary to the people that have threatened to kill me um, the people that have threatened to rape my wife in places you don't want me to mention and uh, um, but very, very, very scary things. I've still got them on my voicemail. I've kept them. Um, but uh, um, my wife said I'd be crazy um, to, to, to move on. But this one gentleman was pretty nice. And I said, would you feel any differently if you watched the entire film and a few moments later, Reverend Monk came back in and sat down? I don't know if you noticed, but the police did not escort him out of the room. He left the room on his own. He came back. Would it make a difference to you if you knew that Reverend Monk got an opportunity to speak later that night for another four minutes? And he said, yes, it would. And I says, well, you know, it is, I'm not, I'm not going to sit there and try to tell the story over and over and over again. I'm not even saying that anybody is, is, is given a biased presentation of it. But when you can explain the entire context that sometimes people do change, change their mind. I just don't want to be in the position of having to defend it and drawing even more negative attention. So that's the reason I've pretty much left it alone. alone. Ms. Dubasan. Thank you, Mr. Hall. I appreciate that you remembered the count to three and had I really been in a calm space, I would have told you to just shut your mouth, but I chose instead to say, count to three. <laughs> Since that night, I have watched the YouTube, email, blogs. I have received myself as a non-elected individual living here in Pensacola inquiries from 14 groups that I had been in conference with about doing things here regarding what in the heck is going on in Pensacola. I would point out to you that at the same time that you denied Reverend Monk his rights, you did not allow the public to give input on Mr. Messer's contract um, moving forward, you took it to an immediate vote without allowing for public input. And on multiple occasions during both of those meetings, you had a very, shall we say, unbalanced um, process of allowing conversation and timelines. Arbitrarily changing in moments when you thought things should continue, you would just waive the rules. And at other times when you had had enough of hearing what people had to say, timelines were implemented. Since then, the PR people of the city worked with you in, in crafting a response to the union's call. And then there was a second blog report of a letter that you issued. And in none of those have I heard you say that you recognize that you denied Reverend Monk and others their civil rights. You can talk about suspending them. No one suggested that you suspended them. We are saying that you denied him in the moment the opportunity to address his government. And some of us believe that that is at the core of democracy. Some of us believe that if we are silent when someone, whether they are saying what we want to hear or not, is silenced because it is to your preference that you have become a tyrant. And that is the point that when we say you need to look at the role you've taken, I believe emotionally 
You responded that night from your needs, not the city's need. And I would highly encourage you to look at whether you might serve the city better by sitting on the sideline and giving the detailed information for which many of us admire the facts that you bring to this meeting. With you in the sitting chair position, your emotional response guides this circle rather than your factual knowledge. And I believe the city is not served as well. And I would join with the council members who've already suggested that you consider it. And I would really appreciate if you look at the full impact of your presence on our national image here in Pensacola. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mr. Son. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to let you know, I was really feeling sad, sorry for you, because I know it was probably just a mistake, but you have to recognize what a big mistake it is. And you don't seem to be doing that. I was going to come up here and say, I know it's first day on the job type scenario, but you, I don't think you're grasping it. And one other thing I wanted to ask, I did put in a card earlier. Is there going to be time, because I'm starving to death, <laughs> um, to ask two questions? Do sure. I do? Okay. Well, um, I don't know if you guys are, these are just pl seeds I'm planting. I'm going to, you know, do more with this. A lot of people haven't got their BP money. Um, there's a lot of people. And I don't know if the organization you're putting together, the um, environmental uh, group that you're trying to do, I just know that there's 8% of the $20 billion given to the state of Florida has been given out. Um, why are they holding on to the money? Are we? Do we have any things going on, checking the correct the, the damage? And um, do we have any people on this board that are going to help us, those people that haven't got their money, to get their businesses going or to save their homes. Um, there's a lot more than you think. I put out a call on the internet and I got over 100 hits of people that are just struggling with the bureaucracy. In my case, I was only in business for a year, so they wanted two years, but it's very easy to figure out what we've lost. Um, and then there's one other question I wanted to ask. I've gone to a couple of town hall meetings where they proposed that they're going to do something with Roo Street and as a property owner on Roo Street and seeing $1.4 million being dished out for this over here and the 500000 I really would like to see some trees, you know, palm trees on Roo Street and who do I talk to about that? Um, is this the place where I bring it up? Do I make an appointment sure. with someone? Um, it's Mr. Reynolds, are you walking, writing this down? And also the new chairman of the CRA. It. Oh yeah. Okay. So you, you've got you've got Long several trees. of us here paying, paying attention to. Okay, you. I know I had a lot of questions. I should have broke it up, but. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to respond. To sure. Her. And it's Katie, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Your last name. Krasinski. 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 Uh -huh. um, I don't know if you noticed during the BP issue, and I made light of this, but it's it's sad. I think my kindergartner was better briefed than we as city council members were. Um, all of the actions of BP uh, ended at the county level. The city had to struggle to be involved. The mayor worked very hard. Us as individual council members worked very hard to be involved. There's no one directly on council that would be able to assist you with... The mayor? The mayor doesn't have any pull with the, the you know, what's going on? Um, you'd have to contact the mayor's office. I'm yeah. just saying as a council, mm -hmm. we were completely left out of any decisions. Mm -hmm. um, we could, we had meetings. We were briefed finally on what was going on. So maybe the mayor's office could be of assistance, but directly with BP and then on a county level, your county representative um, can help you understand how those dollars are being used as a state. You know, While well, they're being held by the state of Florida. Right, and we're suffering mm -hmm. because we're not as, you know. Well, Pensacola people. was mostly directed than any other um, right. place in Pensacola, in Florida, and 8% mm -hmm. has been given out. Yeah. We need a champion. We need someone to fight for us. Yeah, it's, um, and, but it's, it's tourist-driven, so, you know, the mouse that roars gets a lot of those dollars, so, but I think that your county commissioner could certainly answer those questions a little better. And if I may, Mr. President, uh, one of the interesting things that we've seen through this and, and one of the things that the, the mayor has been fighting to try to get more city involvement in, as uh, Councilwoman DeWeese has stated, is that the funds flow to the county uh, and then, you know, they're dispersed from there. And uh, it would have been nicer or probably, uh, from our perspective, more appropriate if those funds actually flowed directly to the organizations closer to those most affected. But unfortunately, the federal government uh, determined that that was going to be was not going to be the case. So that that is the uh, the genesis of the issue. But uh, we can certainly take a look at it. And well, we're taking a bus to Tallahassee tonight. Uh, maybe my sign will work. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so 
Um, and as far as the Roost Street, I, I think you were the one that had talked about it at one of the town hall meetings. Is there any plans to do any improvements on Roost Street? I mean, it is. What I, what I spoke about was that the, I recall the De Villiers Corridor mm -hmm. um, needed evaluation from the terminus at the CMP northward definitely uh, to Cervantes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Roos is also a north-south axis. Right. And, and I do want to think, I don't, hopefully it was because of, you know, you guys hearing what I said, they have um, – a couple nights ago did bust the crack house around the corner that's been, you know, causing me a lot of problems. Hopefully they'll keep continuing to clean up that area until it's cleaned up. You're going to see a whole lot of problems when everything happens. So, you know, when we get people down here, it's really, really bad. So, okay, thank you. And, 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 yeah, yeah, Brian. Okay. Well, but Katie, before, before you leave, though, mm -hmm. the fact that you didn't say something nice about me but that you had planned to was is very heartfelt <laughs> i felt bad for you i know okay. it's these meetings are long and not the most fun and you know i can understand but that's kind of the whole problem with our whole system is that um you know people just don't feel like they're being heard so thank you all right thank you uh mr spencer and then your next man. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm responding to fellow council members and their comments um, regarding, um, Mr. President, your, uh, your council president, um, the, the committee of the whole December 12th meeting and then the subsequent uh, Thursday council meeting, December 15th, certainly um, a lot of notoriety was, uh, was achieved. Um, for our, our city and the council during those events. But I, I just, you know, I actually have, have asked for a, um, a transcript of the December 12th um, meeting specifically. I want to, I'm reviewing it because I, I felt like that what occurred December 15th was somewhat um, almost an epilogue um, from what occurred December 12th, and I, I looked at that in its entire context from beginning to end, but there's no doubt there were insightful words that were spoken. Um, definitely, I want you to know that um, I did hear from people that supported your attempt. Now, whether or not the methodology, the application, the style was something they would endorse, they did confirm that they appreciated the attempt to create or to contain or stop the insightful nature of what was happening in the meeting. And, and um, you know, I, I just hope that, um, and that I heard from people that don't live here as well, so those weren't friends of mine. Um, I, I think you've heard the citizens tonight clearly um, I feel I feel bad for those that were were angered um, I feel those that felt feel bad for those that felt violated I feel especially bad for you and your wife um, for being on the receiving end of, of threats that that definitely um, you know it's just something none of us as public servants ever want to to be a victim of that um, and the anxiety that goes with that. So I'm, you know, I'm sorry that your position as president has already um, introduced you to that. But I just appeal to fellow council members to be understanding and, and in this regard, I think that our president has a very, very clear message from, from us, his peers, as well as from the population. And um, I, I just expect from knowing Mr. Hall that he will um, take all of these comments to heart. And I, I seriously doubt that, that not only will Council President Hall put himself in that sort of position of vulnerability again, I also equally hope that the, the citizens that perhaps reached a level of um, like I said, using in, insightful words and statements would uh, would back off of that. But again, I, 
I think isolating it and looking at it just in the YouTube video does, does not at all show the picture from the beginning to the end, including the committee of the whole meeting. And um, so I, I don't support you um, resigning if you want to take that home and think about it. I think it would be disruptive, and I encourage you to stay. Well, thank you, and I will give that equal consideration okay. to everybody else's uh, recommendations. Ms. Myers. Well, the, I think two things. I think in the eyes of the public, it would be very helpful if you would uh, apologize to Reverend Monk. Okay, I think that's one thing the public would like to hear from you. The second thing is that I hope that the council has learned something that I've wanted you to learn for a long time about this, the right of the people to redress their grievances to the government. And unfortunately, the type of language that the courts have said they can use to express their grievances to the government. I mean, there, there's a, uh, um, in Nash, at, at Vanderbilt University, there is the uh, First Amendment Center that was started by uh, a friend of mine, I'm proud to say, John Sigenthaler, whose son you may have seen on the news. He was the uh, editor and publisher of the Nashville, Tennessean largest newspaper uh, in Tennessee. And uh, I have found uh, some very interesting cases uh, on that website that really surprised, surprised me at what the courts have said citizens can say to their government. And the government is not just us, it's employees who work, who work for, the, for the city. Are all, that, that they're the government too. So uh, I am really hoping that the, that the council has learned something through this uh, uh, event. And uh, so, uh, you know, I just, I, I, I do think that there would be less of a inclination on the public to ask for your resignation if you could just simply apologize to, to Father Monk. I think that's what people want to hear and want to have confidence that you understand the magnitude of what happened and that we can move on. Thank you. Ma'am? Sorry you had to wait. Hi, my name is Robin Richard. I want to um, kind of put three things together here. The first is really going to be self-serving, um, uh, but it will tie into the other ones. On Thursday, a group of volunteers are getting together, and we're uh, providing 4,000 free new books at the Martin Luther King Parade on Monday. We're really proud of that. This is the third year, and we, we'll, we will have, uh, by Monday, given away over 10,000 new books. Dr. King left an amazing legacy. And um, so we really want to continue that legacy. The candy's great, the candy's what gets the kids out there, but the books is what takes them far and provides that foundation. <coughs> Dr. King was an amazing man. I think we can all agree with that. That's so a week from today. Pardon? Week from today. Uh, it's Yes, Monday the 16th, <laughs> yes. Um, and so Thursday we'll be putting those together. Um, and, and Dr. King also went to a healing place, and that sounds to me like what this council need. I am very proud that this council uh, forged ahead. Dr. Thomas Boston, the noted economist, said that three things are needed to make a city great, and, and the first one was bold leadership. The second was a shared vision, and these may not be in order, and the third was creating opportunity. And I really do appreciate that the council took the bold, the bold leadership to do the disparity study um, and then also it goes to bold leadership about tonight and what's happened to the council over the last couple of, uh, over the last few weeks. Malcolm X said that when you, some people call it progress, when you stick a knife in someone's back six inches and take it out three. 
And that's what's happening, I think, to our council and that's what's happening to our city is that we have to take the knife all the way out with the disparity study. Because if we don't, then we won't heal. It is progress to take it out three inches, but it's not healing. Healing cannot begin until we take the knife out. And so to you, Mr. Hall, whether it's an apology or whether it's a resignation, you have to decide what your healing point is. And you have to have bold leadership enough to take that step. So thank you. Okay. And we hope to see you all on Monday at the parade. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Anything else? We're adjourned. Thank you.